very much indeed to Professor Byung Yo Byu and the Kyung Hee Brass Octet. And now to give the first of our welcoming remarks, please welcome Vidar Helgeson, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation. Madam Vice Minister, Mr. President of CAST, Nobel laureates, learned friends and friends of learning. It is a great pleasure, finally, to be able to open this Nobel Prize dialogue. And I wish to thank President Ok John Yu and his team at CAST for the partnership and the hard work in uh, getting us to this point. And I said finally because this Nobel Prize dialogue was planned to take place in 2020. And what has happened in the world during these years um, really puts our topic, the future learning, uh, into context. A pandemic resulting in profound disruptions of life and society, economic and social conditions around the world, a war in Europe with grave global repercussions in terms of food, energy and economic security, and a climate crisis which is uh, no longer only a scientific fact, but a fact of life. These are examples of an unpredictable, fast-changing world. So when we talk about the future of learning, uh, we need to realize that the future is coming fast at us. Take the many climate and, and nature emergencies that we have seen in virtually every country around the world this very year. They teach us about a future coming faster than even science had predicted, and much faster than society has realized and responded to. When uh, world leaders met this last week in uh, New York at the UN General Assembly, there was much talk about a polycrisis, a multitude of problems now facing humanity. And scientific efforts, scientific achievements and scientific collaboration are essential in order to solve these problems. And because of the speed with which that polycrisis is unfolding, the interplay between science and society and decision-making in society needs to be much speedier as well. So in a paradoxical way, future learning is really a future which we already need to learn from. We need to try to take lessons from the imminent future to uh, apply those lessons to the crisis that the world is facing. Or in Alfred Nobel's words, to apply those lessons to the greatest benefit of humankind. And that's why the topic before us today, the amazing panels before us today, with uh, Nobel laureates and other experts that will shed light on future learning is uh, so exciting. And I look forward today to see efforts to the greatest benefit of humankind unfolding on this stage. Thank you very much. And next, please welcome Uk Jun Yu, President of the Korean Academy of Science and Technology. Good morning, uh, dear laureates, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to welcome all of you. And I'm very pleased to announce that the Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul 2023 is being held here today. Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul had its first event in this auditorium in 2017, which was six years ago. Since then, many things have been changed. In particular, the COVID-19 pandemic, 
lasting for over three years, has changed much of our lives. In the meantime, the president of Korea, as well as the prime ministers of Sweden and the United Kingdom, have all changed. The Korean Academy of Science and Technology and the Nobel Foundation also have new leaders of their organizations. On the other hand, there are several special things that have not been changed. The passion for education in Korea has not been changed at all. Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul 2023 is still being held here today. Laura Spretchman and Adam Smith, who are in charge of this event, are also here with us. If any of you who attended the 2017 dialogue are sitting here today, again, it can be the most valuable, unchanging. Traditionally, education in Korea has been regarded as the largest asset that parents pass on to their children. It has played an important role in remarkable economic growth of Korea. However, the education system has become excessively competitive and focused mostly on university entrance examinations. This can sometimes turn into a serious social issues. Therefore, I hope that today's dialogue on future learning will provide a valuable opportunity to lead our education system into the right direction. In this regard, I think this topic will bring about the most effective results when it is dealt with in Korea. Today's occasion with the five Nobel laureates and renowned experts is profoundly meaningful and such a gathering would not have been possible without the Nobel Prize dialogue. I was told that many students came here as audience, including medalists of the Science Olympiad, young first authors who have recently published outstanding research papers, and students from Science High School for the Gifted. I believe they will be our future science leaders for Korea and the world. And these expectations make me much happier. I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all of you once again for participating in this important event. And I sincerely hope that the Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul 2023 will be remembered as a priceless experience for all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. And now, to give some celebratory remarks, I'm delighted to introduce Sung Kyung Cho, first vice minister at the Ministry of Science and ICT. and technology move the world. Today, I'm thrilled and grateful to be the presence of Nobel laureates who have demonstrated the most profound influence in the world and scientists who are creating the beautiful influence. The Nobel Prize uh, is one of the most prestigious awards in the world. It's not an award. It symbolizes the potential and expectation of how much further humanity can progress. 
the research, discovery, and passion of the laureate offers us new perspective um, and wisdom, inspiring us to make the world a better place and times. Through our conversation with the Nobel laureate today, I believe we will face many challenges in understanding what our research and development goals should aim for and what we need to explore and learn. This is a precious moment marking another meaningful beginning for us. Science and technology profoundly influence everything from our daily lives to global economy and societal structure. The influence of science technology is increasingly powerful. Science and technology have become not only a pillar of the economy, but also an absolute weapon in this diplomacy and security. There's a new order is forming whether nation with shared value collaboration in research and development and share their accomplishment. Consequently, the degree of the global collaboration has become a benchmark for measuring competitiveness. Therefore, scientists must not only conduct research, but also consider the impact of the, these advancement on society. The evolution of the science and technology is a double-edged sword and perhaps even more complex. As the influence of science and technology grows, scientists must possess deep insight and a high sense of ethical and societal responsibility about the change their research may bring to society. We shouldn't simply uh, pursue what's possible in technology, but strive for what's right technology that benefit humanity. Recently, South Korea's science and technology, as well as our scientific community, are preparing for revolutionary change to leap forward anew. We are well aware that the Nobel laureate and great scholar have never ceased to challenges even in difficult and unfamiliar circumstances. I believe this is precisely the path that South Korean science and technology must pursue. The South Korean government will establish a bold and innovative system to enable these researchers to take on challenges and continue to do so. Today, at this event, I am confident that through the dialogue of the Nobel laureate, we will reaffirm our hopes for the future of humanity and society, drawing inspiration on how we can make the world a better place. I also anticipate that the inspiration from today will spur wave of innovation in the Korean science and technology sector and the, our daily lives. I hope that the efforts of Nobel laureate and greatest scholars from South Korea to share thought and embark on new challenges for a better future when and today, but will continue on every possible occasion. Thank you once again to everyone who prepared for this Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul 2023 and to all attendees. I respect Professor Joachim Frank, George Smith, Michelle Levitt, Dr. Harvard Mixia, Professor Konstantin no uh, Noberslov, and all the greatest scholars from around the world. Science, technology, and innovation are our dream. 
and the power of create our future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adam Smith, and it's my very great pleasure to be your guide to today's Nobel Prize Dialogue. And allow me to add my welcome to all of you gathered here so kindly together in our auditorium in Seoul. It's wonderful to see you here. Thank you for taking the time. And also to our online audience joining us from all over the world in all sorts of different time zones, welcome. Now, the Nobel Prize Dialogue, as you know, is a gathering of Nobel laureates, experts from Korea and other countries, and we bring them together in different groupings throughout the day to discuss many of the important aspects of the topic we're covering, the future of learning. And most of the conversations will be done in panel discussions. But to begin, we have two talks to set the scene. And the first of those, I'm delighted to say, is from Song Chul Shin, the former president of KAIST. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you for Adam Smith for kind introduction. Good morning, distinguished, distinguished uh, guests and students. It is indeed my great pleasure and honor to deliver an opening talk uh, with the title of Education Reform in the Era of uh, Great Digital Transformation. In the coming years, we will face unprecedented changes in the human society, mainly caused by three megatrends. First megatrend is hyperconnectivity. Now, more than half of the population in the world are connected by mobile phones or internet, and also there are more than 50 billion devices connected through IAT. So within 30 years, most of people and electronic devices in the world will be connected and communicate at the velocity of light. Second mega trend is super intelligence, realized by a rapid progress of AI due to the deep learning algorithm together with advances in computer hardware, brain science, and big data. We human beings are so shocked by the fact that Google developed AI AlphaGo achieved landslide victories against the human champions. Last year, OpenAI has introduced ChatGPT, a conversational AI that can chat with a human being and also follow, answer follow-up questions. With such a rapid development of AI, as futurist lay culture file predicted, we might face a singularity point where AI surpasses in human intelligence. In the near future, AI robots, robot sapiens will be omnipresent everywhere. Here are just a few examples. Chatbot, AI guide robot, AI golfer. How are you? Well, it's Everything late. Is going yeah. extremely... AI guide robot, AI golfer playing holding on, AI gymnast, wow. AI this? table tennis Yesterday, robot, AI robot chef, which can cook 5,000 menus. Now, now a serious question for you and me is what is the identity of a human being in the me mega trend of a super intelligence? We human beings cannot compete with the robot sapiens regard to memory, information process and calculation, routine and repetitive work. So we human beings further cultivate 
irreproachable merits of a human being, such as a creativity, empathy, insight, and wisdom, and then homo sapiens symbi symbiosis with the robo sapiens. It's not moving well. Okay. The uh, third mega trend is metaconvergence. New findings and inventions will be most awkward through interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary approaches, in particular, NV convergence, sending for nano, bio, information, and cognitive science. Furthermore, we live in the society where the physical, cyber, and bi biological systems conjoined by sensing, communication, computation, and control. So considering these megatrends, what kind of manpower should we foster in the coming years? My answer is to foster manpower equipped with three spirits. First, challenging spirit that copes with unsolved question and take away not been tried before. Second, creative spirit that can solve the problem with innovative ideas via critical and convergent thinking. Third, caring spirit with an attitude of inclusiveness and ethical responsibility. I like to call this kind of manpower as C-cube talent. To first the C-cube talent, I like to emphasize whole brain education with emphasizing strengthening basic science and engineering education for training your left brain associated with the scientific and mathematical skills and diversifying education of humanities, social science, art for training your right brain, associated with imagination, storytelling, and insight. In the higher education, first step to implement this whole brain education is to break down the thick barriers existed in department central system. This is a model which I implemented as a founding president of a university, a DGS. For first three years, students are educated to build a solid background in basic science and engineering with a diverse knowledge of a humanity and social science. When students become senior, they take the customized education track depending on their future career paths. When I proposed this uh, system about 10 years ago, most of the educators in our country were very skeptical about this system. However, you know, this year, Korean government has adopted this non-department educational system as a national policy in the higher education. We should mention that we have to reform teaching and the learning methodology. I think branded education, adopting flipped learning class, composed of online video learning, and offline discussion-based learning is very effective to en enhance the challenging and creative spirit of our students. Professors' role in discussion class should be changed from one-way passive teaching to two-way interactive teaching by facilitating, moderating, and mentoring the discussions. Our students in 21st century are digital natives. So it is desirable to use e-textbooks installed in iPad or tablet PC, as demonstrated here, and compared to traditional paper textbooks, e-textbooks have many advantages, such as easy crossover from one textbook to another in cyberspace, and implementing 3D animated figures, continuous evolution by easy revision, interactive and ubiquitous learning. Last but not least, I'd like to emphasize the education for caring spirit. It is so important to realize the sustainable future of the global village. We all dream digital utopia. But we are now facing the dark side of the digital world, caused by digital disparity, cyber attacks, fake news, unethical application of AI, such as a killer robot. Also, we are facing many global issues we have to overcome, including climate crisis, infectious disease, nuclear weapon, people in extreme poverty, which might bring about 
chaotic dystopia in the future. So we have to put tremendous effort in ethical education for our students to equip caring spirit with the social responsibility and inclusive growth in the global village. So take home message for you. The mega trends of hyperconnectivity, super intelligence, and meta convergence call for education reform to nurture talents equipped with a challenging, creative, caring spirit who will make a brighter future in the era of a great digital transformation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed. So as you'll have seen from your program, this morning's sessions are called The Value of Learning. And our next talk is entitled Where the Heart of Education Should Be. To give it, I'm really very pleased to introduce Liz Cho, who's the Director of Learning Development at the Vientian International School in Laos. Please welcome Liz. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Okay, <clears throat> let's see. Um, great, we roll with it, right? Let's try this again. We're gonna make rain today. Are you excited? Yeah, you've been sitting for a while, so let's try again. I'm gonna divide this room up. This is number one, so first two sections here. And then let's take the middle from here to here, your number two. Go with me on this. I know the students in the audience, they're gonna get excited. And then over here, let's go with number three. Let's divide you into three sections. It doesn't have to be exact lines, right? Okay, and you're going to follow my lead and you're gonna do as I do. And here, we're going to make it rain today. So you're gonna have to be able to use your hands, okay, and use your feet. Are you ready? If you want, and you don't have to, but if you are able, you can stand on your feet as well. Don't be so intimidated in this space. Let's make rain. Here we go. You're going to do as I do. <laughs> That's the instruction, and you're going to keep going until I change what you should be doing by sections. Here we go. Section one, ready? I have to use this one, right? Yeah? 
Did you hear rain? It's kind of cool, right? Thank you. That was awesome. When was the last time that you created something impossible and made it possible? Pretty cool, right? The questions that I have up behind me are not the questions that I made up. They are questions by this very specific Nobel Prize dialogue event page. We're here today to explore these questions at the age of scientific and technological advancements. As we get ready to do that, I am honored to have this invitation to share with you where I believe the heart of education should be. It's simple, compassion. As a former English teacher, I thought it would be fitting to share my point with you in four different types of sentences in the English language. Let's see if you know them. First is an interrogative sentence which asks a question. My question to you, do you know what you believe in? These are some of the words that are found in the prestigious institutions all around the world, some of which where our panelists come from. Do we live up to the mission, the vision, the core value statements that we put out there to the public? We collectively seem to believe that we care and that we should be focusing on bringing happiness to humanity and share social responsibility. Let's see if we can bring the words back. In looking at these words and at this very dialogue, we are about deepening the dialogue between the scientific community and the rest of society. The rest of society. That means the people who are on the margins, the people who cannot be here today, the people who actually can't even watch this on live stream. Are we deepening our dialogue with the rest of society or are we continually talking just amongst ourselves? If you look, we have care. We have happiness for humanity on here. We have creativity. Do we model that? Do we live up to our potential and what we say is important? Thank you for letting me pause as the slides catch up to where I am. <laughs> The second type of sentence that I'm going to address is an imperative. An, imper an, an imperative gives a command. And my imperative to you, to the educators, is to be kind. Because we need to show kindness to our students in order for them in return to give kindness back to humanity. When the students walk into your classroom, Regardless of where they're coming from, because life is happening, do you welcome them into your classroom and make sure that they feel your kindness as you are trying to teach them anything at all? Because if we don't model that, then how will they learn? Charles Darman, you might remember him, as a person who believes that the world is lived by the survival of the fittest. When you actually read The Compassion Connection by David Rakel, he points out that Darwin had actually, when it comes to humanity, it is the kindest that is the most important, that kindness is the foundation stone to social interaction. How are you kind to your students on a daily basis? Let's see if this will now catch up with me. Three is an exclama ex exclamatory sentence, which means that you exclaim with excitement like this. You're amazing. Hey. 
can we honor you and dignify you for the unique individual that you are, regardless of your race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, religion, age, because before any of these social constructs are layered into you, we see you as the creative human being first with endless possibilities. And when you fail, because you will, life pattern tells us that we do, we're going to lift you up so you can pick yourself back up and go at it again. You are amazing. The fourth and last type of sentence is a simple declarative, and a declarative simply makes a statement. And that statement? You belong here. We can't put pause on life. There's no pause button. But students who come to learn from you, they come with their lives happening as they are trying to learn. Wherever they're coming from, can you make sure that the students feel they're exactly supposed to be right there with you? Mark Manson, the author of The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F, <laughs> says, we're responsible for experiences that aren't our fault all the time. And with that, life happens, but it's not about hoping for a life without problems, because that's impossible. Instead, it's hoping for a life full of good problems. Let's help our students see life this way. Students come in to learn while life is continuously happening. How can we ensure that we invite the diverse voices to the table and help shift perspectives and paradigms so that the world is hopeful, the future that we build is hopeful? Because without that, we cannot deepen our dialogue, and so we need to create a space where they belong. The future of our education rests on our ability to center compassion because without it, we cannot help learning to move forward. How you will you remember these four sentences? Let's review very quickly. One, remember to check what do you believe in, be kind, you're amazing and validate. You belong here. And remember, everything you can imagine is real. And when you doubt that, remember that today you made rain here in this space. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. Oh, <laughs> what do you? Thank you. I have to say that sitting off stage, listening to your creativity making rain, I was completely distracted. It was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, now we move on to the first of our panel discussions. And we're going to have a day where we're going to think about many different aspects of learning and education and focus very heavily on science and technology, but we thought we ought to begin in the broadest possible sense by asking what is education for? What is the purpose of education? And to investigate that, I'm delighted to welcome four panelists. Anyong Choi, who's a chemistry teacher from the Korean Science Academy. Lynn Goodwin, who's professor of education at Boston College. Kostya Novoselov, 2010 Nobel Laureate in Physics and Jul Razak, who is the rector of the International Islamic University in Malaysia. So, please, welcome them. Oh, You're here. Oh. There's a seating... Oh. I think we do... Oh, that you have disrupted the seating plan. They, they, ha they had you alphabetical. I think it probably matters for the microphones. Lynn, you, you should be here, okay. I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Jul ah, and, yeah, and Kostya there. I think, for some reason, it, it, technically it works. <laughs> um, during this session, I'm also going to ask the audience to participate with some questions and comments. So please be ready 
to raise your hand when I point. Um, before this meeting, we asked the audience if they would send us some videos of what they think the purpose of education is. And it's pretty scary to hold your phone and record a video, and so I'm incredibly grateful to those brave souls who gave it a go. And we'd like to play just a very short video showing some of their responses. <laughs> I think that education is one of our most basic human instincts. Just like eating and sleeping, humans naturally have a thirst of... Education is not just about growing intellectually, but also to help us become a better person. The discovery of one's talents and weaknesses and how to overcome those specific challenges. I personally think that education is meant for the advancement of our society. Education is a means to address inequality. That's because resources are limited, so you have to use them smartly. So scientists study better ways and educate people with each. Thank you very much indeed. It's interesting that those comments are very broad brush as well, that people seem to have risen above the task of passing exams and thinking about education in a much broader way. Lynn, let's start with you. What do you think the purpose of education is, and how would you how would you follow on from Liz Cho's talk? So I'm really happy, actually, to follow from Liz Cho's really inspiring and excellent talk, because her focus is on a purpose in education that I think we have strayed far from, with our attention being diverted to human capital um, and to economies and how to make sure that children develop the skills that they need in order to fuel, to drive um, economics. Education is supposed to be the great equalizer. And I'm here to, to, in some ways, agree with Liz Cho to say that in many ways education has become the great de-equalizer or dis-equalizer, that is, become a tool for separating and marginalizing and sorting and ranking children into those who deserve a good education and those who don't. So if I think about uh, Liz Cho's talk and if I look at these uh, short videos, what has the focus been? On being a good human being, on being able to develop your capacities, on learning, not to necessarily achieving. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed. Jewel, would you like to follow on from that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very exciting time to talk about education. But I thought education is about you, just like what the speakers have been saying. It's about you and how do you know yourself. You go back to the days of the Greeks, education is always framed as know thyself. Unless you know who you are, in other words, unless you educate yourself in that sense, you will not be able to function in the society at large. So to me, education is about how to repurpose education. We've got talks like, you know, what is the heart of education? Some people say education, heart of education is education of the heart. In fact, Plato was said that if you educate without the heart, then it doesn't mean that education at all. So I think we need to go back to the very basics of first being human being. So all the things that have been talked about, being kind, being caring, and all the spirit things and spiritual things that we talked about, are the fundamentals of education. We need to start from that. I would rather believe that I'm a spiritual native rather than a digital native. I know who I am, and then I can then deal with whatever else that I need to deal with from my point of view. And that is what connects us all of us. We are all human beings. Korean, Malaysian, wherever we come from, we are all human beings. And that is the glue that connects us. And if you lose that glue, then you begin to think of yourself in segmentation way, and this is where the problem of education is all about. And I'm very glad to see that everybody is saying, no, let's not just talk about STEM, let's talk about STEAM, for example. Where's arts? Where's management? Where's ethics? We cannot deal with science without all these things. So bring this back together, Adam, is what I think education is all about. It is not, it's not new, but we need to go back and repurpose education for what it is meant to be. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, let's have everyone's comments on this first. Kostya, would you, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I've been thinking for quite a while about this this uh, section. How can I, in one minute, summarize what is the what, what is the purpose of education? And I think 
planting the seeds of the critical thinking into into our brain is probably the the simplest way to 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 describe it because we are born with very um, uh, animalistic uh, instincts in our in our brain so it's uh, it, it works for in, in in quite a few circumstances but there are cases when we really need to demonstrate uh, that we are human beings and this rational thinking and critical thinking is really what 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 uh, distinguishes us from uh, from uh, any other species and and but this would, uh, that has to be uh, brought into you so you, you have to be educated to 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 have this uh, this rationale in your in your brain and i think that's you, that, that's the measure that's the major purpose and of course as um, uh, any uh, neural network or machine learning you still need data to make the to make the to to predict the, the next step and 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 that's what is also required i would generally avoid uh, 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 mixing knowledge and education together, but actually some knowledge are, uh, are also important to, uh, mm -hmm. to to provide this critical thinking uh, apparatus into your into your brain. And the and the last one, I think, uh, curiosity. So just bringing curiosity into uh, in, 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 into yourself. So there was this beautiful video that we are as human beings were fundamentally curious, that's, that's true, but actually I think it's uh, encouraging further curiosity is, is, is a purpose of education as well. Thank you very much indeed. So very nicely the three of you have introduced the heart and society and the mind into this discussion. All of these need to be taken, um, taken into account when talking about mm -hmm. this. Um, uh, Yun Yong, Yun Yong. Mm -hmm. You are a chemistry teacher dealing yeah, right. with a very highly selected group of students. Yeah, very, yeah, right. <laughs> so much like many of the students who are with us in the, in the, uh, in the room today, mm -hmm. very t a very talented, successful bunch of students. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you approach it, and how do the comments that have been made so far oh. re relate to how you approach your students? Yeah, all right. It's uh, creativity, passion. They are commented about creativity, right? Passion, challenge. Since the head of Shinsinjo is commented, challenge importance, right? So, all right. And uh, uh, today I want to keep importance on the resilience and competence. Uh, yeah, it's also. Resilience and competence. Re yeah, resilience and competence. I'm chemistry teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, look at the chemistry world. Chemistry world can be divided by three words, right? Chem is try. Try. Try is very important, right? Important <laughs> challenge, right? So uh, we have to try. Students have to try and fail, try and fail. Those, through those experiences, they can overcome, right? They can overcome and they can develop their resilience. As I think knowledge is also important, creativity is also important, but as I think resilience is very, very important because they can try again. Right? They can develop their, their resilience, they finally they can be confident, right? So actually, uh, probably some people ask me, oh, they are, are you asking me, right, yesterday, they are so young, right, to develop, uh, to, to right, overcome the failure, but teachers should be there, right? Yeah, we can help them, we can support them to, to overcome their failure, and then the, the experience can be developed, can develop resilience and finally confidence. Mm. Yeah, actually, proud have their own time to bloom, right? So teachers can wait for them, and that they can develop their resilience, and that they can be confident. And also, we have to, uh, we will provide. Actually, our school is a kind of pioneer in the kind of high school. We are the first school for the science gifted students. So we actually provided many, many programs, right? Kind of research, can I, can I talk more? Well, uh, yeah. maybe in a minute. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give everyone a chance. Uh, uh, yeah. But yes, your pioneering approach mm -hmm. um, 
teaching people that failure is okay. And mm. I love the idea of allowing them to bloom. Mm. Um, that's something, Lynn, mm. coming back to you, that uh, not, education doesn't often feel as if it allows students to bloom in their own time. It's too pressured. Mm. You're right. Um, and it goes back to the very beginning of schooling when we were trying to sort of manage and organize massive numbers of young people. Um, and so we sorted them by age and we sorted them by grade um, without a whole lot of attention to the fact that there are you know, multiple diversities in any group. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that from your own families. Mm -hmm. uh, your brothers and sisters are going to be very, very different from you even though you grew up in the same environment you know, with the same uh, parents or family. Um, so the idea that our brains continue to develop throughout our lives that learning is a developmental process and it doesn't happen on a particular schedule. Um, that there are folks who are sort of quick out of the blocks um, as learners and others who are more of a slow burn and need uh, a bit more time. Um, not because they have, quote, special needs, but because they're different kinds of learners. Schools are just not designed mm -hmm. um, and have not been designed mm -hmm. um, to accommodate the human being as mm. a learner. Schools have been designed as managing organizations mm. to get people through, mm. um, you know, sort of a schooling experience mm -hmm. to an end goal, which is a, a diploma or a degree. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll connect to Liz Cho again when she started out with all those wonderful rhetorical things that people say about what education should be. And we say it all the time. Mm. Those words are not new to any of us. But living up to those words continues to be a challenge. And part of that challenge is connected again to that sort of ranking and sorting, where fundamentally we have yet to truly enact a deep belief that every child is a learner, is capable, and is worthy of a good education. Enough love for every child is not happening yet um, in our society. And we make our decisions based on that, how we spend our money, where the best teachers go, how schools are resourced, the list just goes on. So I think there's a lot of reckoning that we need to face. Mm. Mm. Does anybody want to jump in on that? Yeah, that's, <coughs> I think that's a, a very interesting point that unfortunately over the, uh, over the years our schools turned into NHS GPs. They, 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 don't, they, they don't really provide care, they provide just a barrier between, be, between you and the, uh, and the health care. So they, they just provide this selection pathway and then, and, then, and, and then just kick and try to sort people out rather than pro provide education. Not even, uh, not even knowledge. So that's uh, and 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 that's been a tradition for many many years, and I think I think it it has to be changed in in, in the future. Mm -hmm. I like come to come back to the idea of reform. Somebody talked about reform. What sort of reform are we talking about? From my point of view, I think education has shifted a great deal because of the industrial revolution in the 1700s. Schools and universities now, to me, is no more than a factory. It's just how, how people produce goods. We are one of those products. We are called products anyway. And you are supposed to be marketed somewhere. And this is where I think the whole idea of education has shifted. I think we need to go back to what education is all about. And this mm -hmm. reformation is something that I think we need to think back. And I, I talk about repurposing because education, when it started, it started to be a better human being. Mm -hmm. How do you create a better human being in a society? Mm -hmm. School is about a small society that we learn how to function with mm -hmm. before you go into a larger society. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a real lab. How do you function in a, in a school which is a society that you need to practice whatever you learn to be a better human being, to create a balanced society, to create peaceful and harmonious but if you don't do that in schools, then the moment you go out in a larger society with a lot more challenges, you will not be able to function. And the pandemic tells us this very, very clearly. Most of the schools have to close. Most industries have to close because we are not able to cope. There's no resiliency. The coping mechanisms of in, terms, in terms of emotion, for example, are not there. So suicide rates are going up and all the other things that we know about. The next pandemic I'm worried about will be your mental health. Until and unless we deal with mental health as part of education, it's not something that you're going to sidestep or you know, 
push it aside because it has no economic value, mm -hmm. and therefore you don't teach them. It will, go, it will come back and hound mm -hmm. you. So the whole idea of reformation, I think, needs to be very clearly understood of where we need to move and to lift up human beings mm -hmm. in a very dignified way. I agree with Lynn. How do you level up society at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. If that fails, then I think education has failed in the general sense. Mm -hmm. Salutary words. Thank you. Resilience again. I'd love to get some comments from the audience. Um, you are, most of you are either in education, looking at all the wonderful students in front of us, or involved in education, or are educators. Does anybody have a question or comment? Raise your hand and wave it so that I can see, please. Anybody? Here's one. Can we have a microphone? There are graces running towards you with a microphone. Here we go. Thank you very much indeed. OK, thank you for all the panels for the good comments on our education. And I can agree more to Lin's comment that education should, be act, should act as an equalizer, mm -hmm. but recently is acting more like a um, de-equalizer. So I want to ask that, like, uh, recently in Korea, we are facing the problem about the education for the gifted so what do you think, like, which way is better, like, educating everybody in every same direction or segregating the people, like, classifying them as the, where they are gifted and give the education separately? Thank, thank you very much for the question. So that's a difficult one, which many people have wrestled with. Do you, <laughs> do you segregate people out? So I think that dichotomies are always um, problematic, right? So this kind of, do we do the same for everyone or do we single out folks? And, and I, I think that there's in between. So I think that the one thing that we failed at doing is sort of um, providing a fundamental quality education for everyone. Um, so just beginning with that premise. Um, the second is this idea of personalized education. Mm -hmm. That's become something that we talk about a great mm -hmm. deal. Um, so how do we create um, classrooms, schools, and educational experiences that allow students to follow their curiosities? The fact is that classrooms don't allow um, the exploration um, because there's a timetable and a curriculum that one must deliver and get through. Um, there's a conversation about who's gifted. That's not a conversation that I'll enter in today, but I do want to ask the question, how do we measure giftedness? And isn't it surprising who ends up being designated as gifted? Uh, typically is someone who is more upper middle class or middle class, male, um, and in a US context, white. Uh, isn't that a problem? Uh, that should ask, <laughs> cause us to ask that question. Mm -hmm. So I think that where there are examples everywhere around the world in schools and classrooms and teachers who are providing that kind of thoughtful, rich, exploratory, and rigorous education. Um, so the question is, how do we learn from those examples? They're everywhere. And the second is, how do we scale up? And the third is, do we really have the will to support that for everyone? Thank you. Thank you. Young, uh, we, were, we, we were talking yesterday, but you were telling me how with your gifted students, uh -huh. you have this lovely it's a metaphor of snorkeling. You allow them to yeah, yeah, right. uh, explain that uh, to uh, everyone. Okay. Uh, actually, knowledge is so vast, like the ocean. So imagine yourself snorkeling in the ocean. If you just uh, deep dive and explore uh, every area, and uh, eventually we'll learn out of breath, right? Uh, so, what can you do? We cannot explore everywhere, right? So, we have to scan the surface and we have to find out the spot, interest us, right? It's education exactly the same, right? At first, we have to scan the surface. So, we have to provide many areas to students, and the students have, should have freedom to select their major, their interest, what they like. And that they can probably deep dive and immerse themselves, and that they can passion it and creativity. So that's why I want uh, students should be exposed 
to many research activities, many international exchange programs, and some elective courses, many elective courses. And then they can be uh, probably a trigger, it can be, it can trigger curiosity, read oh. question, more creative, more passion. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, so, yes. Uh -huh. so, yeah, it seems to fit perfectly with the mm. purpose of education being mm. to find what triggers one's mm -hmm. curiosity. I think, I think we're so the, just coming back to that very important question. So I think mm -hmm. the 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 big problem here is that when we talk about uh, uh, education, it's not the, the same about uh, as uh, uh, when we talk about schools and universities, because schools and universities not are not only uh, giving the function of education and, and providing knowledge, they're also giving the functions of uh, social lifts, of the uh, of the of great equalizers and, uh, and so on. And as uh, if we uh, and those are competing functions. And if you keep providing these uh, controversial demands to our schools and and universities, you, we, we keep getting these this, uh, strange results that uh, we have, rather than equality, we get inequality from, from the education. Thank you. But are, are they conflicting demands, Jewel? Do you think? Do you think that, that you, can, you can cover both? I think we can have both. I think we need to balance. Life is about balancing. Yep. So when you go to one extreme and leave the other extreme, then I think this is where the problem starts. I begin to believe now, after the pandemic, that school has been too much on livelihood, or education has been too much of livelihood. Everybody wants to come to university because you want to be successful in a, in a certain way. Somebody say, this is success, you know, a celebrity or whatever, fame and names. Yeah? But we forget about life altogether. So when the pandemic comes, you do not know how to organize our life. When we are locked down for a week, we can manage. But two weeks, three weeks and more after that, we do not know how to manage life. We do not know how to deal with ourselves when you're alone. The whole problem of now is about loneliness. Despite all the networks that we talked about, loneliness is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. and how does this connect? Mm -hmm. You've got all the networks, you get all the, you know, the likes and whatever it is that you're used to, but yet loneliness is a problem. And how do you deal with this? I think we need to come back to this balance, uh, Adam. How do you balance livelihood and life? Mm -hmm. You know you have got so much in livelihood, but what is your life? Some successful people, sometimes their lives are very miserable. Mm -hmm. People who are economically not well off, their lives sometimes are better. They are more happier. They are, you know, they, they are cheerful. They don't grumble so much. So to get this balance and to bring it back into education, and I do agree that education is not just classroom. The whole world is about education. You are here, it is part of education. Mm -hmm. So how do you broaden this perspective, mm -hmm. the perspective that everywhere you go, you learn. Mm -hmm. I come here, I learned a lot, and I see all the things that have been done. So learning is a process that goes on 24 hours, 24-7, how do you deal with this? I think we, this is what I think the issue mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. okay. Provocative question, so just uh, in, in the long run, how your students are, are doing? So, uh, <laughs> so um, how many are, uh, so in comparison with the regular school? Uh, so it's difficult how many of them are CEOs, I don't know, or professors or job uh, <laughs> So actually, <laughs> uh, we are, our education purpose to nurture well-rounded individuals, actually for society, but it's uh, like Nobel laureate, it's a special purpose, it's no, like yeah, Nobel laureate. Let's, yeah. let's cut that. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, our, uh, actually, initially, we tried to nurture uh, young people to eat. The, uh, actually, it's honestly, it's a Nobel laureate, really. It's a science. Nobel laureate. Nurturing laureates. Uh, okay. uh, laureate yeah, scientists. Yeah. Scientist, yeah. Uh, and then, finally, they can contribute to society, right? It's a uh, uh, society. But now, we want to make them happy, right? It's, uh, Individual happiness is very important, yeah. right? Mental health, like that. So actually, we want to uh, nurture some kind of, it's the first I commented well on the individual, right? So they can be uh, less stressed and much happier, right? Much happier and also creative, and they can also function in the society, right? That's, that's very ideal. It's, idea, idea. But okay. yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult to measure how people uh, have done, isn't it? Yeah, right. Um, let's have another comment, please. There's a lady here, please. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. Can we turn the microphone on? Thank you, Grace. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you so much. I have a question for Professor Costa Navasolo. And as I know, you have visited a lot of countries and mm. you must be experienced a lot of educational systems. And which one most were the best or maybe the most impressive, remarkable? Thank you so much. <laughs> mm. well, thank you for, for this question. Um, <laughs> I don't really, uh, it's difficult to say, but I think uh, I, I can tell you from my experience, at least. So what I'm really grateful for uh, for my life that I had I, I had a chance to try different things. At, at a certain moment, I actually pr pretty much quit the university. I had my own uh, con construction business. I was I was earning money for, for, for some time, and then actually good money. And then, but then I was lucky that I tried it. And uh, I figure it out that that's not what I want to do in life. And you really need to try to uh, in in quite um, uh, in quite um, not uh, being being already adult because you are so when you are 16, 17, that's very difficult. And coming back to, to that question, I think I think it's really important to uh, have to have a try for many different many different things and in, in this sense this liberal art education in US where well, when you have this first year of just exploring things I mean okay some people explore different things so they just uh, uh, so beer and, and, and all the other just types but but a, a lot of students actually explore different courses and select their uh, their uh, the, the direction of, of, of education during the, this year. And I think this is a very, uh, very nice example of very good education. But you became, a, you, you had a construction business and then you became a Nobel laureate at the age of 36. Yeah. So something in your education, presumably in Russia, gave you incredible confidence that you sort of at least knew who you were. You moved fast. Well, that's, uh, uh, but, but that's actually exactly what nothing can push you to move fast, a part of yourself. And, and this self-motivation is extremely important. And when I hire my PhD students, of course, I look at their background and, and knowledge. But self-motivation is probably the dominant characteristic. So if, if they're not motivated, if they're not curious by themselves, I won't be able to to drive them, and that's what what really helped me. That I, I really tried many different things, and I mm -hmm. definitely knew for sure that science and condensed metaphysics is exactly what I want to do. Mm. In a way, that's the gift, isn't it? The gift is to discover. But you, uh, it's very difficult to to uh, discover it when when, when you are uh, 17. So it's really you, you really need to try uh, different things. Mm. In, the, in the little time we have remaining, does anybody want to pick up on that? Joel? But to try different things, I think, is what education is all about. You do not know who you are until you try a variety of things. It's just like food, you know. If you're just used to one food, you think that's the only thing. But when you try a variety of food, then you know which one you like. And you can then channel your interests. And this is where I agree with you, the self-motivation is something that is very crucial in driving you. So you don't have somebody else to supervise you. You supervise yourself, and that's what education is all about, I think. And something that I was reflecting on when we, did the when we named the panel um, the purpose of education, it's strange because the meeting is called the future of learning, and everybody likes learning, but a lot of people don't like education. So finding out what you like is, for many people, a complete failure with education. At the end of the day, they haven't liked it at all. What do we do about that? Lynn, would you like to? So I've been thinking about this whole idea of interest. 
um, and finding out what you like. And I completely agree uh, with my fellow panelists that there isn't enough um, sort of exploration and experimentation in schools that enable young people mm -hmm. to try things out. Quite often mm -hmm. you're trying things out for the first time at university level. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you, know, you take the beer route because you've never had any experience sort of being thoughtful about your own education. Um, but I want to talk about motivation as well. And sometimes we think of motivation as mm -hmm. something that's sort of imposed from the outside or something that some learners have and some don't. Um, but I want you to think about a young child, a five-year-old, mm -hmm. who is uh, completely engrossed in something for hours. They say children can't sit still. Well, they can sit still for things they really want to do. Mm -hmm. If you think about someone learning how to skateboard, have you watched young people learning how to skateboard for hours on end, falling, 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 and getting up? That's mm -hmm. motivation. Mm -hmm. So motivation is connected to this desire mm -hmm. to attain something that you mm -hmm. care about. Mm -hmm. It's true. In the case of my teenager, though, it's probably spending hours looking at their <laughs> telephone. Doing <this. laughs> that, unfortunately, is all we have time for on this panel. But it's been a lovely start to the day. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. Thank you. And thank, thank you for the questions. Um, we'll have more chance to have the audience participate later in the day. In a short while, Lynn is going to moderate a panel following on from this one on the important question of equality. And to set the scene for that, uh, I'm going to invite Anna Dadio, who is a senior policy an analyst at UNESCO, to give an introductory talk in which she'll also touch on the question of how, digi how the digital revolution is changing education. S but for now, to all my panelists, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Um, and delighted uh, to, to see this room full and uh, so eager to hear what we are saying. So this put a little bit of a pressure, but uh, it's very nice. So I'm here, um, so I, I will present uh, two things. One thing is really about uh, um, technology in education. Our Global Education Monitoring Report this year was about technology in education. And rather than starting about questioning what education can, what a technology can do for education, he started asking what is the education system we want and what education for can do, uh, what technology can do to improve education. And so, as you know, uh, sustainable Development uh, Goal 4 is the SDG 4 and is about uh, equitable, inclusive, quality education. So the three questions, the main question that the report asked this year in its first part was about is technology able to improve quality, equity and even efficiency in education? And in fact, the short answer, and is really a shortcut, is maybe it can. Um, technology offers a lifeline for millions. It helps to access education, it helps to access contents. Um, it can provide a most efficient way to deliver education and uh, access to learning. Uh, for example, if we think about the potential of distance education, if we think about what is about lifelong learning analytics, and it can increase also quality. But the sure point is that technology is changing education, but is not yet transforming education. There is something that says that, for instance, if we look at open access resources, 90% and more of the content is provided in English. Other languages are not really looked at. Um, if we look about the potential of technology in education, many people think about the digital divide, but the digital divide is not just in terms of skills, it's also in terms of access to infrastructure. 
And if you think, for instance, at this particular issue, we know very well, looking at primary education, that about 20% of schools globally don't have access to electricity. And uh, if we think about sustainability, we realize that uh, technology has a huge potential, but also has consequences. And this is important then to look at and to ask four questions. This is how the GEM report this year has decided to look. Is the use, before deciding about the use of technology in education, each policymaker should address four questions. It is scalable, it is sustainable, it is appropriate for local and regional context, it is equitable, or it's just privileging the well-off uh, students. So that's why the title is a tool on whose terms. And this is why these questions are really important. And the, the idea, the main one of the main messages of the report is that uh, rather than thinking about technology as technology, we need to think about the learner's interest and put it at the center. And uh, the focus should be on learning outcomes, not to digital outputs. If you distribute laptops or devices, but you don't think about what will be the use of these devices, you will not improve learning. And the point is that also another one. So what the report does um, is uh, to look at uh, the, um, the status of education globally. In fact, it is the monitoring tool of SDG 4, the Sustainable Development Goal 4. And uh, the question it has asked this year has been uh, how far we are from achieving Sustainable Development Goal 4. And in fact, one important thing is about funding of education. And if you look at this chart, uh, we can see that A2 education, for instance, has increased very slowly since 2015. And uh, COVID had a huge toll also on this, uh, and aid from educa for education has decreased between 2020 and 2021, especially in those areas, in those regions where it's needed most, like in sub-Saharan Africa. And if we think about the digital transformation, we have estimated that a full digital transformation in education will cost one billion per day just to operate in the poorest country, which would prevent them to achieve sustainable development goal. And uh, so, looking at the progress and to set the stage very quickly about the discussion that will take place today, we have seen that there has been progress, but uh, a lot remains to be done. And this, in all of the targets of the Sustainable Development Goal 4, about, as I said, equitable, inclusive education and lifelong learning. So early childhood, the percentage of children one year uh, younger than the official primary entry age who are in organized learning remain constant at 75%. And in particular, COVID has caused a, show, a really uh, huge decline in pre-primary participation in many countries. Learning, there has not been much progress, even in, pre -prima, in primary education. And completion, once you are in the system, where you are, once you are in education, I mean, the important is how, how do you get out? Are, is, are you successful, successful in uh, getting your education career? And uh, we can see that completion rate have increased, but uh, um, the progress is very slow. Um, okay. So, and as I was saying before, COVID has affected learning in many countries, uh, and even more than uh, in, in uh, the poor countries. And also it has exacerbated inequality. And uh, another important point is that the number of out-of-school out of uh, children, youth and adolescents has increased with the new um, data that have been published 
last Monday have shown that 6 million more, more of children are out of school. And this has been really mainly determined by the crisis in Afghanistan, but there is also the COVID pandemic that has played a huge role. And I'm almost finished. Uh, and when we look at gender parity, this is really something that has not uh, been achieved anywhere, and in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, this has not been achieved at any education level. So, to answer the question, are we on track to achieve SDG4 in 2030? The short answer is really no. If countries were on track, 6 million more children would be in early childhood education, 58 million more children, adolescents and youth would be in school, and 1.7 more um, primary school teachers would have been trained. So to get back on track, um, more than 1 million uh, children need to be enrolled in early childhood education every year. A new child needs to be enrolled in school every two seconds until 2030. And um, annual progress in primary completion rates need to almost tribal. So progress has been made, but a lot remains to be made. And being on track is really important, not just for education, but for our society as a whole. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anna, and thank you in particular for getting through that fast. Anna is Italian, and she was warning me that she says, I'm an Italian, I always speak all the time. I know it's <laughs> going to be difficult to keep me to time, but you managed well, beautifully. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, so now we're just setting up our next panel on achieving equality in education, uh, moderated, as I said, by Lynn, and she'll be joined by Anna and Jewel, who you've already met, and also... Munjung Park, from a professor at Posttech, and George Smoot, who is the 2006 Nobel Laureate in Physics. So, if you'd like to take your seats, so, yes, there's the seating plan. Uh, Lynn, you're here. Anna. I'm here. Yes, there. That, that's right. Thank you. George, uh, you're at the end. At and, the end. And okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you Perfect. Over to you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, again, um, for being part of this conversation. So um, I'm going to try and be a ruthless moderator, because I know that our time is very, very tight. And I want to be sure that the panelists have a chance to respond to each other and sort of build from uh, the comments. So I'm going to start with one general question. And um, if you could each take you know, a minute or a bit to give us um, a primary principle um, a main idea, something that you're passionate about from your perspective, particularly your discipline or your field or your area of expertise. Inequality in education. It's an enduring, endless conversation. And we continue, as Anna said, to have so much work to do. What do you think, from your perspective, is one primary reason that inequality persists? Anna, I'm going to start with you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, that's a really good question, and uh, we can uh, answer this question in many different ways. Um, I think I, I would like to start by saying that uh, inequality persists uh, because, <laughs> because uh, um, maybe uh, the resources uh, should be distributed in, not just in an equal way, but in an equitable way. Okay. And I think the first and foremost important issue here is distinguish between equality and equity. When we talk about equality, we think about the distribution of resources. So we assume that uh, to have more equality in education, you sh we should have resources, the same resources to each school and each student. While uh, the issue of equity and fairness and inclusion are a little bit different. So why inequality persists uh, is maybe also because uh, those that are most in need uh, do not get a fair share of the resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we did, uh, mm -hmm. tell me if I'm going beyond the one okay. minute, but when we, when we published the inclusion and education report in 2020, we said that uh, there is one thing that's really important is all means all. 
And so this means that uh, inclusion should be looked at the way to value every, lear every learner, to, va to value the potential of everyone, and do not distribute the chances according to the background of individuals. And I think this is not happening everywhere. I just show on purpose the chart on um, education financing because education financing should be a priority in each country. And unfortunately, it is not. And uh, um, there are very few, there are two benchmarks that uh, concern financing education, and very few countries attain this benchmark. I would say half of countries have not attained these two benchmarks about the amount of spending on education. So um, it's about resources, but it's about uh, also uh, training of teachers, it's about classroom, it's about giving safe and learning environment to students and caring, we heard about uh, this thing, making everybody learn and uh, ensuring that parents and communities are involved. So inclusion and equity or equality are not a process that should be enforced from the top but require everyone to participate and that's a reason why inequality persists. Maybe. Okay. So it sounds as though the inequitable uh, distribution of resources becomes kind of a tipping point for lots of other um, inequities. Um, George, um, an answer from you that might be different. What in addition to inequitable distribution? I, I think, um, my speaker, my microphone's not on as far as I can tell, but I, I think. We can hear you. So that's good. Korea has done an admirable job of making high connectivity internet available to everyone in Korea. That has been key to a strong education. And we're reminded that only half the people in the world have good connectivity to the internet or any connectivity to the internet. So already there's this tremendous inequality. And when it started going in the United States, that was very clear that well, people who are well off could afford for their children, internet to their home, you know, computers at the time, now you can do it on your smartphone, and so forth. It's, it's very important. And there is a revolution going on in education which people don't notice. Sitting right there this morning before the thing, I took a Duolingo course in Spanish, mm -hmm. so make sure to keep my streak going, 180 days. I do it on the free, Nora, who's sitting there next to me, she has 580 days in a row on, you know, learning French, and she pays, I think, about 100 a year, right? Some people can't afford 100 a year. They have to have a smartphone, and then they have to pay for access to this education. That's, a, that's an example of education. <laughs> but even in Korea, the education isn't, it's, it's much, the opportunities are very good, but I did an event, I did, interaction with the Seoul High School of Science. Those are really outstanding students. It's like taking your best, you know, athletes and training them. And they have great stuff. Like, and I went to them and I did what's actually effective teaching, which was funny. I went to the creativity of student asked for money to do some of these things that I'll tell you about. And it happened that the transit of Venus across a beautiful transit of Venus across the sun was, was happening at that time. And I asked them to design an experiment and told them how they can design it. They had more, they had telescope accessibility so they can make a projection and measure it. And I arranged for a school in Australia to coordinate with them so that they could measure the distance to the sun very accurately and then report back to me when I came back afterwards. And they explained what they did and what they measured and so forth. And then one of the students was explaining how come they didn't get exactly the 150 million kilometers, they only got 140 million kilometers. And it's hands-on experience. Understanding statistics, they needed to do it more times or have simulations. It's, that's the most effective way to get a change. Having a teacher in a classroom is actually a very inefficient way of doing education. People aren't realizing that because it's tradition, right? I then... So can I just sort of uh, connect what you're saying? Because it sounds as though you're, you're talking again about this idea of when you have the resources, 
yes. you're able to do amazing things. Right. And the so question goes back to what Anna said um, about yeah. the distribution. So let me just uh, move on to the other panelists because okay. I'm just worried about our time and I want All to be right. sure everyone Sorry. gets a chance. Uh, if we have time, I'll tell you about yes. actually yes. doing the thing that Professor Shen said. Mm -hmm. And it gave me more than half my contact hours with students in my whole teaching life. You know, 40 years of teaching and, and that course that was taught twice gave me 70,000 times 10 weeks. That sounds like a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Moon, Moon Jung? Mm -hmm. So, uh, from a perspective of parents uh, raising a little kid, uh, I want to talk about uh, elementary education inequality. Uh, when I was a student, there was saying that a dragon was born in a stream. But in these days, it appears highly unlikely because you know, children in poor you know, income, in, in, in low-income family, they were you know, small opportunity, opportunity to, to get early child education and also uh, limited access uh, to their extracurricular activities. And, and that make impact when they become uh, high school, middle school student. Mm -hmm. And I also want to acknowledge, um, you know, the growing you know, significance, the family residential uh, place. So for example, the school in the big city, you know, of course a lot of resource there, but schools in, in suburban place, they have an obvious limited resource and you know, unfortunately less, less experienced teachers and also uh, limited access to the information and technology, and that be, you know, gap was widened uh, during this COVID pandemic. So I think that's the, uh, one of the big issues from the beginning, from the young you know, age, this e inequality start. And other thing, uh, so during this COVID pandemic, I experienced that uh, we do that in inequality unintentionally. Nobody like recognized, but we, we do, by, even myself. So last year, I had an opportunity to mentor an, an inter internship student in my lab, and she was the last semester of her fourth year. And I, I, I noticed that she has a huge drop in her GPA in her second and third year. So I assumed that, oh, she didn't you know, pay, pay too much effort to her study during that time. It's quite usual, actually. But when I asked her, she answered to me that oh, she has a hearing impairment. Mm. And it was almost impossible to follow Zoom in a class because you, know, you share the screen, the video getting very small, so hard to recognize her, you know, the teacher's mouth. And even in transitioning back to in-person lecture, nothing changed because teacher wear a mask. Mm. But you know, even I, myself, I do the class, you know, but I couldn't recognize I have that student in my class because no one actually informed me, no one Mm -hmm. Tell me the guidance. So this kind of thing is so unintentionally. So we can actually solve very quickly. So, so it sounds as though again you are offering um, another um, sort of perspective mm -hmm. on inequality mm -hmm. and inequitable distribution mm -hmm. of resources. Mm -hmm. But you've added one thing, which yes. is the assumptions that we yes. make of learners. Yes. 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 So Zul, your your thought on this? Thank you. I, I want to go back to where you started, Lynn. I think education is about leveling up society. And that's where I look at quality or inequality for that matter. And for that, I think there are four things that I would want to achieve. I, would, I call it the four E's. One is it to start off with, is it available? In technology, for example, is the technology available? If the technology is available, then it's, it's already a function of inequality. If it's available, is it accessible? Mm. Right? Sometimes you have the technology, but only to certain people, certain portion, others are not accessible. Majority are not accessible. If it's accessible, are they affordable? And the other A, sometimes you can't afford it, especially high tech nowadays, you can't afford it. And the last one is, of course, the other A is, is appropriate. Is it appropriate? In other your context. Doesn't mean all technology is appropriate to you. It depends on your context, your needs and your wants. You cannot just have a one size fits all. So if you use this four as a guidance, then perhaps you can get closer to what uh, equality is or inequality, depending on what you are. So to me, it's quite well laid out. And when we want to make a decision, we look at these four A's. If the four A's are met, then I think we'll go for it. Otherwise, we'll stand back and see what else we can do to make it more equitable. Thank you. So Zul, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, let, me, let me stay with you, and I'll just move in re reverse order. So if you had a magic wand and you could um, put in place one intervention, one something 
that would be a powerful tipping point change, what would it be? Well, I, I guess this is the whole idea of how we can come together as a group that supports each other. Mm. We begin to think of humanity as an issue. When you look at the pandemic, I think that's what was missing. We know that it's a humanitarian problem. Everybody faces it, no matter wherever you are. But the moment the vaccine comes in, then you see the world is in the divide again. You see, the whole idea that we are together, having the same problem, we are supposed to sympathize with one another. When the vaccine comes in, that somehow that disappeared very quickly. So these values, uh, Lynn, of the three things that I want to emphasize, can we learn how to sympathize with one another? Hmm. We do not know how to sympathize with your neighbor. Forget about the world. You will not be able to sympathize with the world. If you are able to sympathize, can you empathize? In other words, can you go out and do what you need to do within your own limits to make it happen so that everybody shares? If you can sympathize, can, can you be compassionate? And then these three values must be in the new education system if you want to achieve equality. If you don't have that, if you just work as for livelihood, as, as mechanical, then I think we will never achieve this. So these three values, I think, is important. So I'm talking about value-based education at the mm. same time to, reach, to reach, achieve equality. Thank you. So, uh, Moon Jong, based on what you just heard Zul talk about in relation to this idea of inequity and inequality, mm -mm -mm. one tipping point change mm. that you would put in place. You know, as Anna says and I says, I think research is more, you know, very important. As that. So I think the government-driven um, reallocation of the asset to school funding equally. In particular, I think, as I mentioned in the last part of my comment, so they probably need to allocate more funding of the small school to serve the disadvantaged community. Because, you know, we are living in, uh, in, the, in the area of the low birth rate, and now we need to teach every single student because, you know, that's the only way we can survive in, in the future. So most important, distributing resource properly and even more to the uh, disadvantaged community. As Anna said, it's not just all means all, but mm. all must mean mm -mm -mm -mm. all if we are to survive. Mm -mm. George. I, I've got many stories to tell, but let me think about an example because uh, it's hard. We have Krenna's capability coming up in chatbots. For the last four and a half years, there have been five chatbots who've taken medical exams in different countries and have done better than 85 or 90 percent of the people. You can think about teaching via chatbots and so forth, but I'll give you an example of an attempt to bring up some equality. So I was very interested in helping Africa develop because it's been a kind of a neglected country. And I was friends with the president mm -hmm. of UTELSAT, and I convinced him to make some data, you know, some satellite communication data available to Africa to send information down. And I worked with some people out of the Vatican on, they were very interested in making converts. It's, it's a, to uh, provide small villages in Africa, small towns in Africa, satellite receiving stations so that they, they could do part of the Catholic Church, but we could send education stories down there. The problem came up in that the Catholic Church got inflamed in certain controversies, and we thought it was better not to be associated with them at the time. But in fact, you have to think, there is a way to reach even poor countries, provided you can provide them the, electro the, le the electronic connectivity. <coughs> and we even have made these small stand kiosks with solar cells in the top so that people can come and charge their cell phones, even mm -hmm. though they live in the, in the bush and so forth. There is a way to provide connectivity to the whole world, and that's the way we're going to do it. And we don't need to train quite so many teachers if we train the chatbots to individually tutor people. I mean, there, there is a, a way we can do it and afford it. There's a way, and we can afford it. Anna. Thank you. Um, so one thing. Um, I just start by saying SDG4 is about leaving no one behind. Mm -hmm. So leaving no one behind um, covers everything we have been saying here. And there is one thing that is really important is start early. So early childhood education lies the foundation. And is really, there are too many kids nowadays that are still outside this kind of uh, education. 
and uh, the education system should also learn, teach um, kids how to learn and what they learn. And this is not just learning about facts, it is about learning how to recognize uh, true from fake. And so this is about sure. developing critical skills. And this is very important, especially for the topic we are discussing today. Mm -hmm. And this means also teacher training and quality in classroom. So there is not, and why I started by saying SDG4? Because SDG4 provides the sustainable development goal <coughs> for provides a list of targets. And each of these targets are really important and uh, say what should be the roadmap. But mm. there is no country that uh, is on track to achieve mm. this roadmap. Mm -hmm. But I think one important is start early, really. Okay. Thank you for that. So this morning when uh, President Oak um, opened up um, the this, this ceremony, I was struck by something that he said and I'd like to ask you all about it. He said, education is, is sort of the gift that parents pass on um, to their children. Um, and, uh, and it just made me think about all the parents who desire to give their children that gift, um, but may not have the means. And means means lots of things. It's not just money. And it also caused me to think, what if education were the gift that society or governments passed on to their children or its children. Um, what do you think about that? Human, you know, education as a human right, as a social right, yes. that it shouldn't just be dependent upon what your parents dream for you, although all parents dream for their children. No, I think that even you know, resource allocation, same. You know, I mentioned that you know, paying more resource to the uh, you know, small school, that makes some people very upset who pay more tax to the country. Right. So it's you know, getting consensus very difficult. So mm. it's a time for you know, sustained effort and communication among many body like you know, policymaker, parents, teacher, and student. So without consensus, you know, it's, this kind of the system never will be created. So you know, we have to aware of that. You know, we have a few number of the kids, small number. So it's time we think about what to do in the future. So. George? I, I, I thought that it is a difficult question. That's when we talk about governments, normally it's a difficult question. But I thought education must remain apolitical. In other words, there is a neutral value that all of us can accept, regardless of what sort of government we have. Because at the end of the day, it is about mm. everybody. And you can never get everybody on one platform as far as political is concerned. So how do you create a kind of a neutral environment that all human beings can benefit. I think it's a difficult question, but this is one of the issues that I think we are grappling with when education gets politicized. When it gets politicized and then it moves into a certain direction that sometimes does not fulfill the needs of others. And that's where I think the clash comes in, clash of civilization, whatever you want to talk about it. So how do you then you make it normative in a, in, a, in a neutral way that everybody can have a common platform? And this way I go back to this whole idea of spirituality. I think this is something that we are common in that particular sense. How do you move it? Lynn, we are trying to produce under sustainable development goal, what we call sustainable development goal 18. You only have 17, but we thought an 18 one is good. We are talking about spirituality. Mm -hmm. How can you create another set of values that all of us can come together regardless of where we are? So George and then Anna. Can, can I be controversial? Yes, <laughs> More so than I was. So <laughs> I, I want to put this in really stark contrast. Mm. It will not be that very long before parents who want to can have their embryo child DNA modified to have all the knowledge up through a college education. The amount of information you learn your whole life is less than is encoded on your gene, double the length of the gene, you can have all the information. It's like you went to every class and did every homework problem and you were the top student. Okay. Would you choose that for your child? L along with smarter genes and prettier genes and, and more athletic genes, right? Okay. Some people will, right? That's right. going to happen. You can do that 
cyber genetically too. You can provide people AI systems that will make them effectively smart, right, and well-educated. Some people will choose to do that. If it's a gift from parents, they'll do that. If it's a gift from the government, it's going to be more complicated. So think about the implications to society and to humans given the kind of opportunities you have in the future. And they're not far away. I mean, it used to be people thought, oh, climate change, it's bad, but I'll be dead by the time it happens. Well, they were wrong. Mm. <laughs> they're, they're gonna, climate change is going to be a big crisis some way. Yeah. But this kind of stuff is coming along too. There's all these wonderful opportunities, but there's all these very complex ethical issues that come with it. So when you start saying the government should provide the education, think about what they might provide. So it sounds as though SDG 18 is definitely needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anna. Yeah. So I will start from where you mm -hmm. uh, started about um, uh, education. What is education? Is uh, a gift. Uh, education yeah. is uh, a gift. It is uh, a human right. Should be a human right. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also a public it's good. So, and this is very important because it means that uh, I remember working on the intergenerational transmission of disadvantage or advantages. One of the things that could break the cycle of disadvantage is precisely education. Education cannot be for a few, it should be for all. And it should be for all in the same way, quality. Uh, it should be quality and inclusive. So the point is, we were, we were talking about um, an enabling environment, so the role of government. The government has a huge role to play uh, in making this possible. But uh, having legislation and policy is not all if they are not enforced. So the important thing is how to get these policies and legislation implemented. And the only way you can do it well is to make communities and every one of us to take part in that. So the role of civil society organization, for instance, is very important as watchdog for the human rights, for mm. the rights to education, the implementation of the right to education. The role of parents, the, the role of um, the mediator between the school and the parents is fundamental because as you said, uh, there are parents and very often those that are low, with low resources that are not involved, they cannot uh, participate in education of the, of the children. So it is a gift, but we want to find ways to be a gift for all and not just for a few. Right. Perfect timing. I want to thank panelists. Um, and I, I heard some common themes. Uh, one common theme is that there is a way, um, that it is possible to do, but there are many ethical considerations that um, mm -hmm. must be considered. Please join me in thanking our panelists today uh, for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. You've been standing Thank in the you way. <laughs>another quick change and um, to close this morning's session we're going to move to the subject of educational reform which has already been touched on to talk about that we have Passy Sauerberg who's professor of educational leadership at the University of Melbourne and he's going to give a talk and then he's also going to be joined on stage by three students Jian Kim, Jian Hong and Jay Yu and they're going to listen to the talk and then Passy and the three of them are going to have a short conversation about the talk. So, if you'd like to join me on stage. They're shy. Pa Come. <laughs> please, please. Passy Salberg, Jian Hong, Jian Kim, and Jay Yu. If you'd like to take your seats... You three, over here, please. Okay. On these seats. I have to admit, they look like bar stools, so we should be bringing you a beer or something, but you're not, you have to wait till lunch for that. So please sit down. Hassi, over to you. Thank you so much. 
Ooh, that's loud. <laughs> How are you people? Are you good? It's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, morning. So I'm going to speak a little bit about, just to lead to this little dialogue that I'm going to have these wonderful students that you see here on stage. Um, and basically what I'm going to tell you is that for the last quarter of the century, when it comes to school education, we have been in a, a particular path around the world, somewhere in a little bit different ways than uh, the others. But basically the interesting question is that, what has this path looked like, and has it been the right one? And as, as you can probably see in the, in the title over there, that my argument is that it has not been the appropriate path, and it's definitely the wrong path from here to the future. If you listen to what the pe people were saying before me, it's very clear that we need not just a, a little bit reformed idea, we need a paradigm shift. We need a completely different way of thinking about these things. So I've been part of, part of those uh, scholars around the world uh, during the last 20 years, really, trying to identify what those trends within school education have been. And there are different ways to looking at this, um, this kind of a global movement or education reform movement. What you see there is just a kind of a simplified idea, some of the common things that we have seen in most countries around the world, certainly in most countries within the OECD, that is the, the wealthier part of the world. The one of them is that we have uh, seen education systems relying more and more heavily on competition. Students competing against one another, schools are competing over students, sometimes over smart, smart kids, and the schools are uh, competing within the systems and, and eventually the school systems have been put in a competition. I'm from Finland originally, I know very well, for example, how to compete, or how, how countries have been um, competing between Sweden and other countries in, uh, in the Scandinavia. Um, but that has, the competition has been a kind of a uh, defining um, uh, characteristics. Then we have seen the increasing focus on some academic subjects like reading, writing, and mathematics, or numeracy and literacy, as it is called. And then finally, the uh, growing number of examinations and standardized assessments that have been used also for the accountability purposes, meaning that if the school or teacher doesn't do a good job, you may lose your status, or you may lose your job, or even worse. And this has led into certain uh, things that I'm going to show you a little bit more about. We have seen the declining student engagement um, uh, steadily since the year 2000, or even before that. Student well-being is another one that is at stake right now, and there has been decline in that as well. And also the equity, if you, if you listen to the panel uh, previously, equity or equality has been in a downhill. So the conclusion here is that this, this, is not, this has not been the, the best possible way to build or lead education systems, we need to rethink. But I'm going to show you some data as well. That is a little bit what you saw from Anna. Uh, but I, I try to show you some, some big trends. Like what you're going to see here is three trends since the year 2000 in global education, probably more within the OECD, um, that includes student uh, achievement, not necessarily learning, but student achievement in science, mathematics, and, uh, and reading literacy student well-being, and then the cost per child. This is a little bit different statistics that I'm going to show you what you saw in Anna's, because this is, this is more about how much money we are spending per student, uh, not the proportion part, part of the, the education budgets. So this is roughly the evolution that we have seen during the last 20 years since year 2000. Some of these curves are going up, some of them are going down. Now I'm, I'm going to ask you, that which one do you think the curve represents of these three variables there, learning, well-being, or cost, that is having the steepest decline? What do you think that is? That's a well-being, of course. How about the, the, the only one that is going up? That's the cost. But that's the cost per student, okay. So this is one thing that, you know, if you look at these things, you don't need to be a, a, a Nobel laureate to understand that, you know, this is not good. <laughs> you know, we're spending more money and getting less 
uh, outcomes uh, out of this. I'm going to show you another one that is even more kind of a problematic thing and calls for not just the reform of education, but transformation. We need to, we need to think very differently about how to, how to face this future that somebody beautifully in the morning said is coming to us faster than ever before, that we, we need to be uh, aware of this. Now, this data is from Australia, but this may be the situation in many other countries as well. Now, these two dots there, the blue and red, represent a, two different typical students in a year three, the third grade, so they are about nine years old. So they have been in school for two years, maybe a little bit more. The blue one that you see over there is a typical child from a more affluent family where the parents have better education and, and more family income. Whereas the red dot represents the child who comes from the more socioeconomically disadvantaged family. Now look at this. These kids have been in a school, they may have been in early childhood education at some point, probably the red dot less than the blue, but in the year three, grade three, they the gap between those two uh, students is already about two years worth of uh, school education. That's a big one. So schools were created earlier to level, equalize these gaps. We heard that also earlier in the morning. So when these kids, I'm going to show you what happens to these two kids, a typical uh, kids from the different equity cohorts, when they travel through three years of schooling, three years of primary education, and then uh, lower secondary education. This is what it looks like in Australia. So what we see that rather than leveling these differences, these uh, outcome differences in, in school, we see that it's expanding, and not just a little bit, but a lot. So they have five year, on average, five year uh, learning gap uh, uh, at the grade nine. Huge. This is not what the education should be all about. So that's why, that's why I'm saying, you know, putting these things together, and there's, of course, many other stories, we need to have a new paradigm. New assumptions, beliefs, and, um, and models for how to educate uh, kids. We have heard a lot about those things already uh, earlier in, in the morning. So this is my, uh, this could be a much more complicated story to, to go into the detail, but just to keep this simple, that what this new paradigm could entail, First of all, I think that it should have a very strong uh, element of collaboration, cooperation, sharing, you know, doing things together as a school, as a student, uh, and at the level of the education systems. Then secondly, I think we should focus much more on the whole child. We heard about whole brain earlier this morning. This whole child means that it's not just the academic knowledge and learning that we need. Uh, we need to develop skills and characters and many other things as a whole child, including well-being. And then the trust-based responsibility instead of test-based accountability. That is building trust in students in the, within the school and trust in teachers within our countries and communities and societies to do the right uh, thing. If we do that, and many other things, of course, that comes with those things, we're probably going to see an education system in the future that is building much more on, on enhancing personal relationships. Again, within and between the students, but, but also between students and adults in the school and between students and the community around the world. We see much more holistic learning and well-being rather than training and preparing young people in different disciplines um, and subjects. And finally, we're probably going to see students that are much more engaged in their own learning. And Lynn was speaking earlier about the motivation, the intrinsic motivation. This is the only way that we can see schools in the future when students are more engaged in what they do to be also more motivated and curious and interested in um, what they do. Building a future education system is much more complex and complicated than this. But I just wanted to give this as a lead now when we move to the, um, the conversation with, the, uh, with these wonderful young students about what should we do and, and how the future of uh, education and future of learning uh, would look like. So, what do you think? Can I have the first uh, a, a really quick round with you, starting from you, uh, Chian, if you can say where you're from, what do you do currently, and uh, go through this panel, and then we start the conversation. Hi, I'm Jian Kim from Daejeon Science High School for the Gifted. I'm now learning science and mathematics in high school. Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Jay Ryu. I'm first grade in high school of IASA, which is Incheon Academy of Science and Art. And my, I specialize in computer programming and biology. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jian Hong from Seoul National University, and I currently major electrical and computer science. Thank you. This is an easy panel for me because there are two Jians and, and uh, <laughs> one J, so I try to remember your, remember your names. Let's start with this little, uh, you were here with me when I was uh, giving this introduction, and I was calling for paradigm shift or uh, revolution, if you wish, in school education in the future. Do you see this in the same way based on your, your experience? And I'm not necessarily just thinking about the, the schools here in Korea or schools that you go, but in general, when you think about schooling and learning uh, for the future, do you think we need a, a radical change or just a little bit reforms here and there? Jay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, in the school I am attending now, I, I take two kinds of educations. One is a class format where the teacher gives us knowledge, and the other is a research activity where students have uh, the freedom to uh, do what they want so they can have autonomous learning. And um, from this, I learned that giving students freedom can lead to very creative results. So I think the education should give students freedom to learn what they need and learn what they want. Wonderful. Chian, what do you think? Um, so I don't know if you already know, but private education in Korea is really a huge market. And um, that's because there are like a lot of chicken races, the huge chicken race going on for the tutoring and mentoring systems. So. I think we need to change um, current education form to put down those kind of um, irregular uh, high education like chicken races. And what would it look like from your uh, point of view? So I was part of it. I was part of it in the past. And like after school, every student, even f students from elementary school, goes to academy to learn mathematics and like Korean, English, and all, all so, sort of things. So it's kind of absurd, I think. Good. How about you, Chian? Mm, I think everything is going on so fast these days, including education. And I think education should slow down a little bit. Um, there is a nice time to think more deeply or creatively because of fast learning. and. Mm, Fast learning can have also advantages that we can learn a lot of things and think, think about a lot of things, but uh, I think we have more time to play and do other things we want to do. Right. So, you know, we are mostly, uh, mostly old people that have been speaking here so far. <laughs> so my question, uh, including myself, of course, you know, the, the, the question to you is that, uh, this is a bold question, is that do, do you think that we, people like we, that we really understand the kind of education that you, you need, or let alone the people, people younger than you? Or should we have more conversation with uh, mm. students and children in thinking about this future of learning? Do you think we, have a, we are doing the right thing right now? <laughs> <laughs> These guys are saying, next question, please. Oh. <laughs> Now, this is your, your moment to uh, say, well, how, you know, how, how, how we should build this uh, journey from here to the future learning. Um, um, yeah, so go ahead. The ones who make education policies are grown-ups, like... Just say old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> old people, Thank you. as you say. Um, so, like, but the ones who actually feel the results of those kind of education policies are us or even younger students. So um, I think they should listen more to those students who actually take education. Right. How about you, Jay? Uh, yeah, I kind of agree. And now I am attending a science-focused high school, so I get to learn what I want more than other students. But in uh, normal high schools, the education isn't changing as fast as the society is changing. So 
I think adults need to uh, put more care to follow the changes of the world in ed education. Right. Good. Good point. Yeah. Jian. I really agree with their ideas, and I think that adults should listen to more to students and know what they really want to learn and help them do what they want. Right. Good. So it would be good to have more of your voice in the uh, building the future, right? That's what I'm yeah, hearing. Yeah. Okay, good. Please take this to heart. It's an <laughs> important, important thing. You know, one of the things that, uh, uh, again, you know, continuing the same line of thinking of um, not being a digital native, if that is a proper term, uh, you know, compared to you, that you have a very different view to uh, technology and what it can do and um, what it should not do. Uh, we had a little chat in the in the green room about the AI, and we heard earlier here uh, people talking about the the future of artificial intelligence and what it brings. Could you share with us a little bit how you see the um, the emergence of artificial intelligence and chat GPTs and, and all those robots that we saw earlier here? That is it something that you see optimistically, like like it's really going to help us to address these grand challenges and issues, or do you have some concerns or some advice to all old people here, what we should not <laughs> not do? Any, any one of you? Chai, you, you're almost saying something, so oh. go ahead. Okay, I, I was thinking, but uh, Think I get a lot of help from artificial intelligence in school. I use ChatGPT to do my homework sometimes, and so I think it's very helpful in my life. But uh, if too much of our life is repaired by AIs, um, I'm worried that the connection between people and the communication between uh, friends and teachers uh, might decrease, and that won't be that good for a human society. So, um, like, Artificial intelligence gives help to our life, but we shouldn't replace too much of us with it. Do, do you think that you understand enough about the, that part of technology and AI to be able to regulate your own use of it? Do you have a feeling? Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, that you, you know enough about the, what the artificial intelligence or chat uh, GPTs are about? Or do you, do you need some guidance or help from outside? Uh, from now, I do think I need to learn more about the artificial intelligence right. to use it, right? right? I think we all do. <laughs> Jian. Yeah, so um, as an engineering student, my friends and I am not really good at writing, as you all know. Um, so if you take a writing class in university, we use a lot of like we we use ChatGPT a lot to like compromise like to do that. <laughs> but um, even though we are not good at writing and we can use help from the AIs, but I think we still should um, know how to write our, by ourselves. So yeah. we need to grow our abil abilities to write ourselves and. After we gain some abilities, we can use like the help from AI also. So it is important to restrain some, like not to overuse the AI yeah, yeah, to wonderful. gain the crea creativity. Thank you. Jian, do you have a few on this? Yes, uh, in my school, we use lots of chat GPTs to our homeworks and uh, do some researches. Uh, and it's really helpful to find out more ideas that I can think of. ChatGPT helps us think of new ideas, but I think too much use of it can mm, let uh, decrease our creativity and to think more deeply. So I think we should know the right amount of using it. Thank you. We are almost on time, but I have one last question for you before we break for lunch. Um, and here's my question for you. That one day, probably most of you, maybe all of you, you you're going to have your own children, your own family. It's going to be in the future, of course. Um, if you think about the, the dream school for your own child, 
what just in, in one word what that school should look like so that it, you would be happy and delighted about the opportunity to send your own child to that school. Just one word or one sentence, Max. And uh, while you think, I'm asking this question because, you know, often in these conversations, it's so easy to talk about other children's education rather than your own. But if you think about your own child, that's why I'm asking you. It may be difficult to imagine, but Jian, what what is the school like in the future for you? Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> no, you should say Melbourne University. Yeah, Harvard. but um, it was joke. It was joke. Um, I think the ideal school for my children is the school that doesn't keep the students stressed out because I was really stressed out in yeah. my high school okay. period. So Beautiful. Thank you. Chang? Um, in one word, I'd like to say, uh, no, not in one word. Let's just go a sentence. Um, in normal schools, education is always focused on the average student. And in my case, when I was in middle school and elementary school, I wasn't really satisfied by the education I got. So um, in my case, I chose to come to a specialized high school, but I think that in schools, teachers should provide a specialized education matched to each children's uh, knowledge level and their likes, hobbies. So we should like take care to each student, not just focus on education on with the average students. Thank you. Jian, yeah. you, you have the last word. Uh, I hope future school helps children uh, think creatively and think freely what they want to think and learn whatever they want and make children happy. Beautiful. Please join me thanking these amazing students here. Thank you. Just please just stay while we say, while we send people off for lunch. But you know the the, no, the meeting is all about meeting each other through dialogue, and I think it was a tremendous success, Passy, that you managed almost to break through the barrier of Korean politeness and get them to tell us that we were too old to be talking about this. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Now um, you've had tremendous amounts of food for thought, and it's time for food for real. We are serving lunch. There are snack boxes to be found outside for most, and the special guests should follow the signs for the special guest lunch over there. And we have exactly aha, 43 minutes for lunch. So please be back here at 1 o'clock precisely. See you then. Thank you, Th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Very good. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Now, this next section is centered on technology and learning. And to start us off, Kinam Kim, who is president of the National Academy of Engineering of Korea, is going to talk about who will lead the, the fourth industrial revolution. And just as happened before lunch, he's going to be joined on stage by three students, Chan Yoo An, Myun Sok Lee, and Ji Won Kim. So, may I welcome them all to stage? Thank you. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kinam Kim, president of the National Academy of Engineering of Korea. It is my honor to speak at this venue and discuss future learning and technology with distinguished scholars and future leaders from all around the world. Today, at this session of technology and learning, I would like to share my personal experiences and thoughts on what will be needed to lead the fourth 
industrial revolution. What do you think the future generated by technology will be like? What do you think it will change in our lives? The potential changes in technology and our lives are well captured in this painting and the photo on this slide. The painting on the left side, titled Space Opera Theater, won the first place at 2022 Colorado State Fair. It challenged our long-held belief that creative works are exclusive only to humans. The photo on the right is an AI humanoid robot holding a historic press conference two months ago. It was amazing to see a robot intelligently answering questions from reporters, even rolling its eyes and making faces. Two previous examples represent the core technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, AI and robots. Big data, AR, and the IoT are the other examples of key technologies. In the pre-industrialization era, manpower and natural resources were the primary sources of the productivity. Then came the steam and water-powered machines of the first industrial revolution, followed by electricity, mass production, and wired communication in the second industrial revolution. We witnessed that the third was all about digital and information disruption. And now, the first industrial revolution brings the society of hyper-intelligence, hyper-connectivity, and hyper -therification. Throughout the history of humankind, humans never ever witnessed such macro-scale and visible changes expanding into the microscopic and invisible world. As technology and the times change quickly, so does the talent that world needs. According to World Economic Forum, two critical capabilities required now and for the future are analytical thinking and creative thinking. The implication is that the power of human brain will still be of the key importance, even among ever-expanding technological capabilities. As we discussed, the critical skills needed now and for the future are the very essence of what we hope to encourage and support. Let us look at the, this chart here. The y-axis indicates the core skills for workers in 2023 while the x-axis represents skills needed in the next five years. In the first quadrant, which represent skills needed now and the future, 
analytical and creative thinking, curiosity and lifelong learning, leadership and agility are included. All of this came down to thinking skills, learning capabilities, and an attitude toward work. In following slides, I'd like to share my personal experiences and philosophy about them. First, I believe that you should pursue self-innovation relentlessly to precisely understand and utilize technology the insight gained from looking below the surface is of critical importance. I have seen a lot of companies who are market leaders lost the position because they were complacent and ceased to assess and change themselves. So I want to emphasize the importance of focusing on fundamental values and relentless efforts to change yourself so that crisis can be turned into opportunity. After 40 more years as a semiconductor person, I feel there is still a long way to go. Looking back my whole career, I've been through crisis after crisis. Every time I faced one, I tried to find the fundamental cause and define the essence of the problem in order to solve it. Have an endless dialogue with yourself to find the answers. Then you will naturally think in a creative and analytical manner. Second, never is to learn new knowledge and technology. Being an expert is a process of, in you, of giving your best in any circumstance, upping your skills and learning ceaselessly. Personally, I have the hope to be remembered as a semiconductor person, not just someone who spent his career in the industry, but who never stopped working, learning, and challenging both myself and those around me. To that end, I continue to spend time learning and keeping track of the latest papers and reports to always stay current and constantly learn. I understand many of you get information from digital media, but I'd like to recommend you try to use a traditional method, that is, an actual book. This is because research has found that reading a hard copy and trying to read between the lines enhances literacy and ability to think logically. The moment I cherish the most in my career is when I succeeded in developing one megabit RAM about 35 years ago. That development brought confidence and success in memory business for Samsung. And for me, it was the moment when new chapter of my life began. Though at the time, we were far behind industry leaders, and nobody believed in us. We made the impossible possible. But when he succeeded, 
we didn't stop there to enjoy our accomplishment. Instead, it motivated us to pursue even harder to develop next generation of DRAM. This ingrained me, the minds of the engineer in my heart, which is to never give up and keep going unless it is physically impossible. And never cease improving yourself and your product. Trial and error to find a path will inevitably lead to a solution. If you do it with a never give up mindset and foster creativity, you will find the answer. So keep going to everything thoroughly. I would like to close my talk with an introduction of an anecdote. The invention of the camera in early 19th century alarmed many painters. It must have been a huge fear for them as they were used to simply recording what they saw. However, painters found their own styles and creative identity, which could not be replicated with any technology. Others chose to collaborate artistically with a camera, giving a birth to a new kind of art. Likewise, though technological breakthroughs make us wary and scared, but humans and technology are bound to coexist and make a bright future together. The above three values which I mentioned can be found nowhere but within ourselves, awakening to be awakened. All of you here today will lead a path to next generation of the industrial revolution. Beside the path, I will stand and keep thinking, learning, and researching as well as mentoring. I wish all the best for you and your future. Thank you for your kind listening. Do you have any uh, question or any comment about in, uh, my talk? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, we're, we're very impressed by your lecture today uh, regarding this fourth industrial revolution. Um, uh, first of all, if I introduce myself, I am Myung Seok Lee from Hanyang University, and I'm currently studying uh, mechanical engineering. Hmm. Hi, I'm Jiwon Kim, and I'm in a rising second year studying natural sciences at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my name is An chan -woo. I'm a senior student of Yonsei University, majoring in mechanical engineering. Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so with the lecture, um, we have a few questions here. So my first question is that regarding the fourth industrial revolutions, uh, what is the, the key skills or essential capabilities for individuals or organizations organization to have uh, in the fourth industrial revolution? Your question is, what is a necessary skill for individual as well as company, like organization, right? School or company. Yeah. It's, it's mentioned in, uh, during my talk, I mentioned in... Uh, three key values. One is self-innovation and in uh, constantly learning. And the final one was the uh, in, uh, 
thorough execution. That's the uh, what I believe necessary for an individual. But company, in many respects, almost the same as human. So organization also need relentless self-innovation, constantly learning, and in a thorough in a execution. But differences between individual and in organization. Organization composed of the, uh, each individual. So in order to be in, uh, effectively working, we need another in a capability. Seamless communication and communication skill. And in uh, some way to uh, execute effectively. Hopefully, now <laughs> I answer your question. Sorry, seamless communication sounds very important. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, thank you for a very insightful talk. And um, a lot of uh, great panelists have talked about like social aspects of education earlier. So, mm -hmm. But uh, surely we can't omit uh, like technical and um, engineering aspect of education as well. So. Um, as a student, I feel like um, the science and technologies are more characterized by like convergence of various fields like in these days. And, and considering <coughs> this complexity, like I would like to ask you that: Do you, is it realistic to expect the universities to uh, like, cons like continuously produce these uh, individuals with these multifaceted skills? For example, like for robotics, we need like mechanical engineering, like electronics, computer science, or maybe like AI with uh, chemistry or uh, like bi biology, for example. So uh, what do you, uh, how should university's mm -hmm. role like remain meaningful or mm -hmm. should evolve in this context? So simply saying your question is, what's the role of the uh, university in, in, uh, in complicated in uh, in environment, right? Right. That's in a really good question, but in a difficult to in a answer. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe uh, your question will be in a much better answered by education expert rather than me. I'm just in <laughs> people you know, working in a business sector. But I think my personal belief is neither university can provide every corner of the uh, in a various field, nor every student may need any details of the in a various field. I believe as time goes by, problems much more difficult, more in a complicated to answer. But that's why I need an expert. So complexity, that actually in, uh, stems from the, in, uh, you, you said, convolution of the, uh, in various field. Maybe you can handle that kind of problem through kind of in uh, expert collaboration of the, uh, each field. So in that sense, I believe probably university is the uh, best place to be uh, cultivate or to provide the, uh, those kind of uh, capability for individual being an in, uh, expert. Mm. So. Even today, university is very important. But even further in future, more important. That's the in of my thought. Thank you for the insightful answer. I think I have a question that mm. kind of continues well with what was previously asked. 
um, as a university student studying the natural sciences, we do not have any specialization in the first year. And therefore, that allowed me to, in a way, experience a bit of one of the values you have highlighted as importance, which mm. was seamless communication and trying to continually integrate knowledge from students that are studying other parts of natural sciences. And also, as you have mentioned, and was previously highlighted, hyper-connectivity and communication between different fields has become important with more data in the fourth industrial revolution. And so therefore I wanted to ask if there is any advice you would give to help us communicate better with people and experts in other fields. Maybe in a Based on my you know, experience, communication is uh, very important. But to be a good communicator, first you have to listen in, uh, in, in uh, what? In Korean word, in Gyeongchang. Maybe someone say, you know, what English Gyeongchang? Intensively in uh, listening. That's the uh, first. Then in, uh, you can have a uh, chance to freely uh, communicate. Yeah. And that's one question. The other one is what? Um, another question is regard to another um, aspect that you have highlighted, which is developing ourselves and not being afraid to take risks and continually learning. And so as you have been experienced a lot of um, reaching out to other people in other fields and continuously having to learn as learn even after graduating university or mm. within a company. Mm. So I would like to ask if there is any tips or advice you'd give us to starting learners to be able to have that passion and continually um, know um, how we can more effectively learn go moving forward. You know, now one thing you hope to you know, realize was the difference in academia and industry. Academia, sometimes problem is very stereotyped. Always students try to get in a hundred percent in a perfect answer. But industry, you don't have that kind of in a situation. So always we uh, face the uh, new problems. New problems, maybe you can uh, solve the uh, not 100% in the answer. Maybe sometimes 90% accuracy is okay. If you are in, uh, much faster than in your competitors. So in, in my experience, when problems come, then you know, I go back to you know, basics. Basics normally provide by the you know, basic science. Physics, chemistry, mathematics. Using those you know, tools, you can always expand your areas. Thank you. Thank you. We are always in you know, 30 minutes, so you have yeah. to close this session. Thank you for listening. So another refit and we're on with our next panel. This one on digital approaches to learning and the role of AI. And for this panel I'll be rejoined by Liz Cho and Lynn Goodwin who you know already. Also joining will be Anand Agarwal from MIT, who is also the CEO of edX, the largest provider of online courses in the world. Jaebong Choi from Son, hang on, Sung Kyun Kwan University. I'm doing my best. <laughs> and also um, Michael Levitt, who is the 2013 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. So welcome to you all. Anant, Liz, oh sorry, oh I feel like I got it wrong, I'm sorry, I missed it, I'm, I'm not, can't even count, uh, please sit down, Anant, Liz, yes, uh, Lynn, thank you.
Yeah. We've got a bit mis mixed up now, but that's fine. That'll do. Yeah, I hope they can sort it out. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an enormous panel. Um, and it could have been even bigger because, as you've probably noticed, all, all our participants pretty much talk about digital approaches uh, and they touch on AI. So anybody could have been on this panel. And I'm delighted to have you five participants with me. Thank you very much indeed. I want, we're going to talk about AI, but I just wanted to start with the digital provision of education. And Anna, let's begin with you. During the pandemic, of course, there was a sudden acceleration in the, in the um, provision of uh, learning via uh, the internet. Uh, online learning became the standard. And now things have presumably changed. So just bring us up to speed on where we are and where we're going with online learning. So online learning has been around for 30, 40 years. But it really hit the scene around 20, 2011, 2012. Uh, the New York Times called it the year of the MOOC, the massive open online courses, where really the key innovation at that time was how do we scale quality learning? And uh, when the pandemic came around uh, uh, about three years ago, uh, for, the, for the 10 years before that, a lot of universities around the world were offering online courses and uh, building, building mechanisms and uh, experiences with teaching online. So when the pandemic came, uh, the whole world had to go online. Some universities did a good job. Uh, they used the best practices of online learning, like use things like active learning and, 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 and other techniques. But most of the teachers went to very boring forms of just doing what they did in the classroom, but did that with the camera. And uh, you know, what people uh, began to call uh, uh, you know, death by Zoom. <laughs> and and uh, that gave people a really bad taste in their mouth with, about online learning. And now when the pandem pandemic has gone away, very unfortunately, uh, my biggest fear has come true. I had hoped that when the pandemic came in, everybody went online, that it would stick. That the notion of digital learning would stick in universities and people would adopt the blended model of learning where you learn 30, 40, 50, 60% online and the remaining time in person, and you got the best of both worlds. And the best of online and in-person is simply far better than purely in-person or purely online in terms of any metric you can think of. Learner engagement, access, equity, name it, you got it. But the sad part is that the pandemic is, uh, is waned and so has digital learning. And, and to me, that has been, I think, society's uh, biggest lost moment. Gosh, right. So... <sighs> When you talk about the blend of learning, what do you think is the piece that teachers provide and that online learning provides? How do they, how do they meld? So I've been teaching uh, at MIT for 34, 35 years. And I suspect that 90% of the time I do stuff that computation or machines or AI could legitimately do a better job than I can. There are several teachers here, and I suspect you'll feel the same. But there are certain things that I do that I think humans can do well. So for instance, uh, instead of giving lectures to large numbers of students, simply have them watch short videos online. It's much better. They can personalize it, they can speed it up, slow it down. It's much more personal. Grading. We can grade personally for students well before AI. And now with AI, we can even grade essays and provide deep feedback and all of this stuff. Much better than a human can. And one of the worst things that teachers, you know, we all hate having those grading parties where we spend all day grading with pizzas. So all of those things can be automated. The part that we can do uniquely well as human beings is motivating students, spending time with students, looking them in the eye and tell them they matter. And talking to them, creating small groups, walking around them, inspiring them, that's the part that teachers can do well. Encouraging creativity, giving them, thinking of new creative design problems. These are things that teachers can do well. 80, 90% of what they do, let's relegate that to digital learning and AI. Thank you. I'd like to get a couple of views on that. Lynn, you're at Boston College. Boston College has an awful lot of online courses and modular courses. Would you agree with what Anna just said? Unfortunately, I, I think I would. Um, so, and I think part of the reason why um, the pandemic waned and we sort of went back to business as usual is in some ways we never left business as usual, um, even during the pandemic. 
So the conversation here has been about digital learning, but I think it's really been more about digital schooling. We just sort of um, transferred everything that we do un under normal circumstances into an online environment. But we didn't change the pedagogy. We didn't do more engaging things. We, in fact, I remember speaking to a principal. Um, I, I, I was dean of, of the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong, and so obviously was in conversation with school people all the time. And I remember during the pandemic, a, a principal saying to me with great pride that he had finally gotten to the point where he had replicated exactly the number of hours, the content, what teachers were doing online. And he's actually a pretty wonderful principal um, who does pretty wonderful things in his school. So it was a bit surprising to hear this, but this notion of simply moving it, it became sort of a geographic thing as opposed to a conceptual thing. Um, so I think we have a long way to go before we get to this idea of deep learning um, and uh, moving away from the familiar and the fact that we still continue to define teaching as someone standing up and telling other people something. Thank you. And Liz, from the perspective of high schools? Um, yes, and I would like to add to that, I think we miss that um, in order for learning to happen, in order for let's take digital learning and kids are learning at home, we have to partner with parents and we have to partner with the students and the environment within which the children live because without that, we can have this philosophical debate of all these great things that the digital platforms can do, but we have to factor in, it's not just the digital screen and the child, it is whether that child has uh, someone at home that is able to support them, let's say that even if they had the device to work with, um, and also what kind of uh, background the parents come with, whether they have the time or they are working and therefore they can't be with them. Um, I think there has to be greater conversations about how to make learning happen. It doesn't just happen because we take certain lectures and put it online and therefore now you have access to that, now let's do something else. There are many children that can't possibly do something else because a school was a safe haven for them. It, mm -hmm. it took them from a place where it's not so good for them and it gave them a place to be. The pandemic taught us that when that happened, a lot of sad things <laughs> has happened. Um, and I think, um, we have to build a partnership and education for everybody on how to rear children and support them in the best way. Parents didn't know what to do with this. Teachers didn't know what to do with this. And we were throwing teachers into it and say, figure it out. Mm. And if you can replicate what we've been doing in school, that must be right. But out of that, I think we need to realize that it's, it's not. We have to rethink all of that and build a partnership with the community. Michael, do you want to comment on this? So I personally made a very early online class, 2003. It consisted of 600 two-minute animations that I made with PowerPoint. I actually called them talklets, <laughs> and I think I was the first person to use that term. Um, it was a huge amount of work. I think uh, each hour of talklet was at least 10 or 20 hours of my time. Having made it, I then gave it at Stanford instead of giving a life course for about 10 years, and I found that I actually got much, much better feedback from the, from the video classes, from the interactive talk classes, than from online classes. So, but it is very, very difficult to make good on online contact, and I think that the AI tools can really help improve content. Um, so uh, it is a hard problem. I'm not surprised that uh, you know, it, it isn't like, I also totally agree, um, during the pandemic, I was actually working very, very hard on, on COVID, as Adam and others know, and I had collaborators, and what I really lacked was standing around a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And I kept on trying to use digital whiteboards, and then suddenly the time lag. If you have a collaborator in California, Europe, and China, it's impossible to find a time long over, a time long over there. So there are really fundamental problems of this sort of global collaboration. But I think that uh, the real answer is a mixture. And you know, we use online for what online is good for. I also believe that people need to learn from anything. People need to be able to learn from any material, because we're going to have to learn all our lives. Things are changing so dramatically, we should never stop learning. So we should actually learn how to learn from anything. 
And that's a hard lesson. It basically involves being, not being fooled. Uh, you know, we should not be fooled by fake news. And that's going to be an important exercise. And I think if there was a class in how not to be fooled by fake news and how to ask the right questions, that's the kind of skills we need. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, we at Nobel Prize Outreach are trying to collaborate, uh, are in the process of collaborating uh, on a project to have courses in critical thinking which address this. And of course, many other people are doing similar things around the world. We, we entirely agree on the importance of this. Jaybom, please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I actually wrote a book named uh, Pono Sapiens. As uh, uh, Pono means phone in Latin, and sapiens is homo sapiens. You know what I mean. People change it from homo sapiens to phono sapiens. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So we are homo sapiens, right? But st students, I thought I watched uh, young students. They use YouTube to learn a lot of times. And they know that um, people, old people, are not that smarter than like AI or YouTube or many uh, uh, very outstanding contents in the YouTube. They realized that from here in Korea, they could watch and learn, like uh, Stanford University uh, professor lectures and MIT lectures, anytime, anywhere. So they believe that this is a good way to learn. And they changed the attitude, and they met pandemic. Even that case, uh, junior school, high school uh, teachers, they quit, and they linked uh, the, uh, in Korea, like uh, some uh, online lectures. So they, could, they couldn't met, they couldn't meet teachers in school, and parents were not helpful in that case. Mm. So they learned it from the online contents, and think about it. And they know that I, if I want to become successful, I have to learn a lot. So they start to depend on online environment more and more. People are evolving, right? Yeah. So they have different window from us. So I think because the education is for them, so we have to see from their window what's going to happen to next 10 years, five years, not to come back to old days. So that's what I think we have to do first. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, because listening, I mean, I was wondering how much we have, we have to avoid being top down here, and that there is a new generation who are so savvy with these tools. And certainly the young people I talk to seem to think that they know how to educate themselves. They may not do so, but there's a certain confidence about that. Does that, Lynn, does that worry you, Liz? Um, I think we, to say that our students are naturally better, better at certain digital tools, um, I think is a bit dangerous. I, I don't think so. I think they're born into it. I think it exists. And especially if we, we use a term like digital natives, um, I think it's a misnomer. I think if we are natives of any nation, you would teach them the laws and what to do and what not to do. But I think when the children have this access that are given to them for adults to assume they know what to do with and they're really talented, what we see in the schools is that they might know certain things, but they definitely need someone with some wisdom to have conversations with them and facilitate what it is that they're doing with what is in their hands. I think to assume they know so much better than us, yes, with some things, but we need that conversation of what to do with what is in their hands. Um, and I think that's the learning that needs to take place. And that conversation needs to be, if, so that leads into um, my argument that teachers are incredibly important. <laughs> and teachers need to listen to their students and sit next to them. And that's what assessment means, not just give them a piece of paper and test, but <coughs> sit next to them and see what they know, see what they can learn. And I don't mean just the student from the adult, I mean the adult from the student as well. And put them together and that should be what learning looks like. 
Um, and I think it's a very dangerous thing to assume that our students know what to do in the digital age, because what I've seen, they actually don't know that. Okay, thank you. I'd, I'd like comments on that, please. Anand? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, we need to get some disagreement on the panel, so I'll uh, mm -hmm. respectfully disagree. I like um, that. I think in most schools and colleges, it's us older people, older professors, that are creating how students should learn. I'll, I'll tell you a story. At MIT, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to do an experiment. Uh, this was six or seven years ago, where I said, right, uh, a lot of my colleagues argued, ah, online learning is no good, there's got to be in person, I have to be there, the sage on stage, you know, uh, I'm the person to teach. And then I said, right, how about we do an A-B test, where half the class takes an online class, half the students take uh, your in-person class, and then we give them a common exam, and we measure things like satisfaction, stress. And uh, first of all, the shocking part was one of my colleagues said, wait, if I don't teach, if it's digital, if I don't lecture, then what do I do? And I had to explain to them that you know, lecturing is only one small facet of teaching. But we did this test, and what we found was that students absolutely loved the digital model. Now, these were on-campus matriculated students studying paying tuition at MIT. Uh, exam scores were similar on the purely digital or online. The stress levels of the students doing the online class was a whole standard deviation lower. And the reasons they gave were that we could do things that flexibility. You can watch the videos whenever you want. The, Mac, the most common video watching time, midnight to 2 AM. Why do we drag them to class at 8 o'clock in the morning? So students in uh, Seoul, do you enjoy, how many of you enjoy being dragged to class at 8, eight o'clock in the morning, raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Not a single hand has gone up. So I, think, I think the key here is that we need to, we need to listen to the students. Uh, they all are digital natives. They really enjoy pacing themselves. Most people watch my videos from MIT online at 2x the speed yeah. and they mute the professor mm. and they read the transcript. <laughs> right. The professor don't like being muted but the students want to mute the professor, speed the video up, and read the transcript. So I think, I think we need to be listening to people. Um, I think they are, it's more flexible. Uh, grading, they want multiple tries. Uh, and so this way they can try and answer multiple times to get the answer. So all of these things lead to lower stress. Thank you, thank you very much. Any, anyone want to make a burning comment? Michael? So I strongly agree with Adam's uh, conjecture. I think students really do know how to learn. Um, and I have a lot of grandchildren, so I can relate to their experiences. And it seems that online learning is, is quite amazing. The other thing to point out is that very, very soon, all language barriers will go away, really soon. Within probably two or three years, it doesn't matter what language it's in, it'll be translated to your own language. So this is something which AI will definitely be doing. Um, I think that we, we always tend to think that the young generation doesn't know things, but the young generation so far has always been smarter than their parents, and I think the young generation that grows up with large language models will be a lot smarter than their parents. So I think that kids can really play a very important role in their own education. It, you know, it, it'll happen anyway. I mean, and it may be through TikTok. It may be through media that we, we don't spend time on. Um, you know, I think it really is a rapidly changing world, and I think any assumption that we think we know what we're doing is probably a mistake. Okay, thank you. Now, I think we might have a potential argument breaking out in the panel here, which is good, um, or at least a disagreement. What I'd like to do is for us to talk about this quietly on the panel for a couple of minutes, and I'd like you, perhaps, to talk to each other. Now, you can... So we're just going to raise the lights for two minutes, and... If you want to, you could turn to your neighbor and tell them your best or worst experience of online learning so far. <laughs> um, it, in the context of the discussion we're having, um, it would be very nice to share with you. The dialogue is all about talking to each other, so now's your chance. So we'll give you two minutes to, get, to do it. That's one minute to you talk to your neighbor and one minute for your neighbor to talk to you. If you don't want to do it, it's fine. It's two minutes to check your phone. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, lights go up, microphones go down on here. See you in two minutes time. Please talk to each other. <laughs> so, um, there's a dis...
to hear conversations happening right yeah. now. Are we back? I like yes. People like talking. Yeah. Thank you. It was lovely to hear, to hear the bubble of your conversations. <laughs> and please do continue over coffee when we have the coffee break. <laughs> Thank you. In those two minutes, we reach consensus on the panel. Liz can sum it up quickly. <laughs> I Very think the consensus was that it's not necessarily a disagreement we're having. We actually agree on the topics that were said, that we have come to the agreement that we're talking about two different things, right? So everything that Anna and Michael said in the way that, you know, s students learn, our whole point was that with all the access that they have, we have to be able to talk about it together and coach each other, the young and the old, and figure out what it is that we're trying to learn. And with the devices in hand, we got into a bigger topic even about who's creating that curriculum. That should be where that com conversation continues, right? What are we getting our students to learn and why is that important? And when we test them to see what they know, what are we testing? And what are we saying is important inf information for you? to actually take away. So um, I think we're talking about two, two different things. Within technology, there are a lot of, a lot of apps, a lot of different ways um, that we can kind of continue to spread that conversation. Um, but yes, in essence, right, it wasn't necessarily a disagreement <laughs> on <laughs> online learning. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, indeed. Um, Jay Bong, you were talking um, we were chatting earlier about this, uh, this young generation of super entrepreneurs and yeah. CEOs and how yeah. they network. Can you just talk about that for, as we lead into the conversation on AI, oh, which yeah. we have a short time? Well, actually, the uh, students, they need a role model. Oh, I, I want to mm -hmm. become a, that kind of guy, right? And the uh, most famous uh, guy in the United States is, uh, yeah, Definitely Elon Musk. You know the second Elon Musk is? His name is Austin Russell. He's, he was born in uh, 1995. So he's 28 years old. He founded the company at, at the age of 15, uh, no, 17, mm. in high school. And he was very much interested in science and technology, coding, etc. And uh, he founded the company in his uh, dad's Garage. The, the name of garage was Applied Science and Technology Lab. <laughs> so his brother coached him a lot, and he learned a lot of from you know the uh, digital environment. He attended a course from MIT, Stanford, California, everywhere, and uh, he founded it. And he went to Stanford University, and he stayed in there for three months and quit it because the investor want, wants him to quit and focus on the company. So now he's a billionaire. He became the billionaire at the age of 24. And what he made was LIDA, uh, which catches the, uh, uh, the, the, the autonomous car yeah. that it detects the human or whatever, uh, yeah, Machine like learning, using, yeah. using uh, Razor. That's very, very difficult product, but he made it, and he, that's the, the, uh, the company name is Lumina. Yeah. And even he actually got the Forbes, the, the magazine, yeah? But the, 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 the example is that these are, these are examples of people who are making their own networks, moving very fast, kind of cutting through all the rules that most, pe that most people live by and are somehow advancing things very fast. Uh, is that, I mean, why are, these people, why are these people role models? Oh, I suppose is the question, very because, briefly. Because students don't take, uh, take a look at any TV or newspaper, right? Teen teenagers. But in the community, wow, this, this guy is famous. This guy is famous. And then, like, uh, only 10 years older, his brother, right? Feeling like a brother and young, looking young. And even he made the multi-million donations to society already. So, they, wow, this, is, this guy's good. And uh, what I'm saying is, they like, like a BTS, Blackpink, and Austin Russell as well, right? And 
he only took one year university education, right? Not, not three months education. So they thought, how they become so smart? It's not schooling, right? It's from everywhere. So what I'm saying is, as Anand said, it's not, you know, school, go to school and give them, you know, laptop and do something. It's not working. Yeah, we have to make education contents to adapt them in their viewpoint and introduce some people like that. Like a science and technology, there are so many students who want to be an academic star like Austin Russell. He's an entrepreneur, but I want to be like a Nobel Prize yeah, professor or researcher someday. And what's contents for them? Okay. Where are they? That's yeah. what I want to say. So Thank we have to do some, uh, do develop some uh, good educational contents for them. Thank you. Yeah. So Michael, as one of the role models just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we don't have a lot of time left. I just wanted to say that we now have all heard about these large language models that have learned so much. Yeah. And I actually think if we look at how they learn, as a machine, we might be able to understand better about how we should learn as humans. And one of the main mechanisms behind these large language models is something called Generative Adversarial Network, GAN. But in fact, a much simpler term is fake it till you make it. <laughs> so essentially, you have two students. Let's imagine uh, Adam and I are both totally ignorant of Korean. But we're shown some Korean, and Adam is trying to fake it by giving me sentences in Korean <laughs> to try to get past me, a bit like a game. And I'm trying to say, no, 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 that isn't real Korean, this is real Korean. And if we do this, and when I get it right, I get a point, and when he, gets it, he manages to fool me, he gets a point. This method is incredibly powerful. It is how computers draw art, it is how computers fold proteins, it is how computers translate languages, it is how computers do almost everything that they do. The advantage is that it's a symmetry. It's not like I'm really scared of Adam because he's the teacher or he's the faker. It's a game, and we both learn together. And I think that this is, could be really used very much in education. I think it's a big way from here. The teachers in these large language models that are also human beings who give them scoring for once they've learned, score them for the quality of the answers, how good they are, generalization, and things like that. But I think it seems to be an amazingly good way to learn something where you try to fake it, and somebody tries to stop you faking it. The discriminator stops me faking, I'm the generator. So this model is really worth learning about. I think teachers should be studying it. So I do think it has been amazingly successful at teaching, if you like, a really stupid block of metal to become as smart as a human being. <laughs> I think, I think in, in this relationship, Michael, I think it's clear that you're the teacher and I'm the faker, but we'll move. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, switch, we switch roles out of it. <laughs> um, uh, Lynn, would you like, you've been quiet for a while. Do you want to comment on this? Oh, there's just so many things going on in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm fascinated by this GAN. Um, and I'm interested in asking Michael, so if, if, you, if you tried to insert that into you know, teacher preparation, um, what would that look like? I think I would, as a teacher, firstly play with it. I think I, I've met a lot of teachers who have asked me about their chat GPT. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you should be spending two hours a day on chat GPT, just asking it stupid questions. Asking how you, know, you can fix the fight with your kids or your f anything, because it just is an amazing experience. And like anything smart, you have to spend time on it. Um, you know, I think a lot of the questions, my answer has to be, I don't know. But I think we are all going to become much smarter mm -hmm. in the next few years. And we have answers to these questions. But I do think um, my wife actually spent 30 years teaching education in, at the University of Tel Aviv. And she was telling me that self-analysis is really important. You shouldn't write an essay. You should write a diary about how you write an essay. Mm. And then this is what you look at. You shouldn't uh, read. You should actually write a diary about how you read and how you're distracted. So I think more self-observation is a very important. But I think teachers can be really important in giving these perspectives, these vistas. I mean, one trouble 
with the internet is there's everything out there. Where do you start? And I think, you know, putting students in the right direction could be very, very powerful. And I think letting them, you know, do the hard work for you. Let them grade each other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that you need to be a supervisor, uh, whereas a lot of teaching, and, and often people say, we, I learn most, I mean, often lecturers, lecturers who make a new class say, I learned most from preparing the course. Mm -hmm. Because you do learn a huge amount from trying to teach. But that should be used at the level of the students as well. On that two hours on chat GPT, it would be interesting to know who in the audience, hands up, spends two hours a day on chat GPT? I suppose some of your student, the students know their teachers are in the room, so they may be a bit, be a bit shy about this, but <laughs> nobody. One hour on chat GPT a day. <laughs> We're beginning. <laughs> Half an hour? <laughs> People who look at chat GPT sometimes. Wow. It's, mm, I'd say it's still the minority. It's not enough. It's growing up. No, growing not up. enough. Yep. Yep. You know, as I said, Adam, last night, we all have to learn to love ChatGPT, not, not to be frightened, because the fact remains that a person with ChatGPT is 50% smarter. <laughs> Become that way. In uh, Songgyunguan University, uh, you have a very <laughs> <laughs> difficult time to pronounce that. Uh, we had a survey after uh, first semester and then asked them, did you use ChatGPT during one semester? And they said 96% say yes. Oh. Yeah. And then was it helpful? 87% said it was very helpful. So I think yeah. I think it's correct. Mm. There's a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of fear among teachers that chat GPT and technologies like that simply provide an answer. Students can go to it like a web search, type a question, they get an answer, and that will completely kill teaching and learning. The trick here is that you can work, as a teacher, you can work with ChatGPT in a way that ChatGPT does not give an automatic answer. Mm -hmm. This kind of engineering is a new form of engineering <clears throat> called prompt engineering, and this is becoming extremely popular. Everybody should learn about it. So everybody should take a course on prompt engineering. And what we've done at edX, for example, is as part of our courses, we've introduced a uh, teaching assistant based on ChatGPT, and we've been able to train AI to not give answers. So when students ask a question of AI, AI does not answer the question. AI behaves like a great teacher. What does a great teacher do? If I ask a great teacher, you know, how do you add uh, four plus four? The teacher might say, hmm, do you know, uh, what do you know how to add? And, and mm -hmm. the teacher might come back with the Socratic question uh, and teach that's by asking that's questions. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. a Socratic method and goes back to your adversarial networks. So what you've done is you can train ChatGPT and AI to teach by asking questions. And so this way, students can actually learn better. So I would, I would encourage all teachers here to actually try those techniques, and you can actually train ChatGPT to actually help students like a great teacher would, uh, and not just regurgitate answers. Thank you. Well, brilliantly, you finish things off at the end of our time by bringing things back to the importance of teachers. Whether they're, <laughs> <laughs> whether they're generative or actual. So um, thank you very much to all of you for this discussion and to the audience for participating. And now we're done. We should get up and <laughs> let them clear the stage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After lunch, there is a slight danger of feeling a little bit sleepy and so we need something to get us going and what better than a k-pop dance performance by the group rubin which will shortly follow as soon as the stage is cleared so enjoy
I think the dancers were faster than were expected. So we're lacking panelists. I am not going to do a dance. <laughs> I'm waiting for our next moderator, who is Ryan Serian Song from Kyung Hee University. Uh, <laughs> Ryan, join me. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Nice <coughs> to see you. So you're going to moderate this next discussion on mm -hmm. the balance between fundamental and applied knowledge, which is fascinating. Oh, and your panelists are appearing. Please <laughs> take a seat. Yeah, <laughs> join us, please. Great. So you, st you stay here. Kos Kostya Novosel Novoselov, you know. Uh, Sejung Oh, fra former president of the Seoul National University, I'm delighted to welcome. Hartmut Mikkel, uh, 1988 Nobel laureate in chemistry. And Jung Hae yeah. No um, from DGIST. I'm very pleased to see you all here. So please take seats um, and please do sit down. Thank you very much indeed. Just before we start, Ryan, I know that you have a great interest in human rights and particularly human rights in the context of digital uh, technologies. Right. And you just heard you may have been completely distracted by the K-pop. I've forgotten <laughs> what you heard before that. But if you, if you can remember what you heard before the K-pop, um, you just heard this discussion on, digi on digital technologies and AI. And I wondered whether you just had a quick comment about the, the human rights and uh, uh, um, in, in the context of that. Right. And not only the previous session, but the through, throughout the whole program, I've been thinking about what the responsibility uh, that uh, scientists and engineers have and uh, using the technologies, but also applying that to education as well. I, I think that there is a very big human rights component in terms of right to educate and, and that education leads to uh, economic development and also all sorts of different uh, things that the humans need at this point. So. Uh, I think that this session is very significant in that the technology and education taken together mm. will generate those environments. Um, I'm also struck by a kind of thought that you know, gave it to me that the AI and the technology is very adaptable and make it a, a personalized a, a, a machine for a learning machine for students not only those students who are advancing or for those students that are kind of falling behind. I, I think that the machine and the AI can kind of adapt to those different uh, speeds so that their learning could be very much a kind of a human effort. I think that they, throughout it all, but I, I think that the message is also very clear that uh, as teachers and as educators, we need the personal touch, empathy, and personal relationships that the, go together that cannot be replaced mm -hmm. by the machines. Thank you very much. But indeed. I gotta confess, yes. half of the stuff I said is from ChatGPT, <laughs> <laughs> including the emphasis on human touch. So, but that, that's where it is. But I, suppo I suppose what we just <laughs> I suppose what we've just heard in the session previous was that that's absolutely fine. That we, um, if we follow Michael Levitt's uh, advice, we le should learn to love it and embrace it right. and use it so you're, you're, you're on the right path. <laughs> Behaving like a youngster, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so please, okay. your, your, your session begins. Thank you. Thank you for joining in. <clears throat> well, this session is about the, the auspicious title, has an auspicious title of Balance between fundamental and applied knowledge. I mean, <clears throat> I want to take a poll, actually, if I may. Here, we got students, educators, and parents as well. Uh, raise your hand. I'm going to ask two questions. Raise your hand, first of all, if you are or plan to be in the science field. But not just the science field, but pure science. Pure science as in fundamental science, basic science. OK, all right. The second, those who want to be in the applied side, 
engineering. All right, thank you. It seems like we have a balance. I see it about half and half. Well, let me start with you, uh, Professor Michelle. This right balance, I mean, how do you take it in, in terms of whether do we need the right balance or not? What does it mean to be, have a right balance? We got half and half. It seems like they want to do what they want to do, what they're passionate about. But does it have a significance to have a right balance? I don't think you can talk about the right balance. But at first I would like to say that I don't really see where the boundary between basic science and applied mm -hmm. science is. For instance, it's very clear that if I watch, say, whether there are uh, exoplanets on different suns, different solar systems, this is clearly, in my opinion, basic science. If I want to explore what kind of organisms live in the ocean six kilometers below the surface, it's also basic science. If I go to biomedicine, uh, the border becomes already no longer visible because we try to explore to find out uh, how many proteins the human body had, has, actually, what is their disease relation? If I find out the disease relation, it's all, I'm already touching uh, the applied science. Mm -hmm. Because if I know the disease relation of protein, I can cure diseases which are caused by a misfunction, malfunction of that protein. So I don't really see where, where the difference is. I, of course, I'm primarily a basic scientist, but I always look, can I apply somehow this, this knowledge which I create for the benefit of mankind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially, uh, Professor Michel, your study on uh, the, the research on photosynthesis, it has a lot of implication on the renewable energy generation, so it seems like there is a very close connection to it. I, right? I, I clearly agree. Uh, photosynthesis overall uh, is a process of very low efficiency. So only about 1% of the sun's energy is actually stored in the biomass. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we have, then have to study in basic science what are the limitations, and it's, it's pretty clear what the limitations are. Uh, so uh, we know that we have photo damage, in particular in, this, in the so-called light reactions. We know that the mechanism of fixing carbon dioxide to create sugars made in the so-called Kelvin cycle is a very inefficient process. Mm -hmm. So if we know that, we can try to improve these bottlenecks and transfer this knowledge into the, in, into the plant system. For instance, uh, in the so-called light reaction, you get in photosystem two, you reduce compounds called quinones, and if uh, there is too much light, then there is no longer quinone available to be reduced. Mm -hmm. And the excess energy then causes the photosystem to be destroyed, to be damaged. And uh, now, uh, what turned out now, if we now find mechanisms to increase the quinone concentrations, we can reduce this photo damage. It's clearly already an application. Another point mm -hmm. uh, concerned the uh, carbon dioxide fixing mechanism. It is clear that a sugar ribulose 15 biphosphate is a limiting factor, in particular also the enzyme which uses the compound in order to mm -hmm. put carbon dioxide into it. So we can do that. And, uh, so far, we, it's clear that uh, we can increase the yield in model plants like Arabidopsis or tobacco by maybe 70% by increasing the uh, concentration of the, of the quinone in, around the photosystem 2 and by increasing the improving the Kelvin cycle by 60-70% mm. each. And these improvements are not additive. And if we can confer this from the model plants to wheat and rice and corn, Right. We might be now able you might to be going into deep. Yeah, <laughs> because sorry, we, can, we, can, we can improve the yield of uh, the crop yield by a factor of two. Right. And this will be a huge effect. Two effects. We feed the world's population, the increasing number of fields so, uh, still on the planet. And on the other hand, due to the increase of photosynthetic yield, we reduce carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and we fight global warming. Mm. So it's a direct application of our basic knowledge. Right, there's a close. Uh, relationship there. Professor No, yes. how would you react to, I, I, I think he said, uh, there's no balance. I mean, it's, those two are artificial dichotomy uh, maybe created by the, the department, the universities. <laughs> how would you I, react I to that? I think in terms of that uh, dichotomy, maybe it's not possible to make a very strict dichotomy because it's rather related. And like he said, I mean, 
scientists who are doing pure science always think about its application to the humankind. So in that sense, it's connected. But mm -hmm. uh, when you did the rough poll, that it says roughly half and half, but I think in actual world, like in Korea, there's more engineering departments and engineering majoring students than pure science uh, departments and, and, and students. But that's the, the reali reality. Mm -hmm. uh, then what's the right balance? I think it depends on I mean, different countries and the, the stages of its development of the country. So it can be very, very different. But there could be some desired uh, uh, proportion that we hope, yeah. But right. it's, it may be different from the reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Professor Oh, you, you're the inaugural, um, I, is it director? <laughs> I, I, right. mm. uh, <laughs> so you might be biased again, <laughs> in favor of the basic science. <laughs> but um, uh, especially in Korean case, historically, we uh, uh, government focused intentionally on the applied science. So the right balance question, how would you react? Well, actually, you can think of this as, I think, on uh, three different levels. Mm -hmm. And the first, the individual uh, scientist level. Uh, if you're a mathematician or a theoretical physicist working on cosmology, you should work on uh, fundamental knowledge. But if you're an engineer, shipbuilding engineer, working in an industry, you might, you should pursue the applied knowledge. So depending on the field of study, uh, in individual, it, it will vary quite a lot. Uh, the, but if you go to the institutional level, mm -hmm. uh, the character of institution also uh, will decide uh, how much emphasis we put on this uh, fundamental or how much on the plus size. If you look at, uh, you take an example of Germany, if the institution belongs to Max Planck Gesellschaft, they will be mostly interested in fundamental knowledge, although uh, they uh, will be interested in the long-term applied sign. Mm -hmm. if, are, if the institution is in the, uh, belong to Fraunhofer uh, Gesellschaft, they, the institution will focus on applied uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think the most meaningful question is, as uh, Professor Rowe mentioned, that uh, what about the country level? How much investment we should put on the fundamental science or applied uh, technology. I think it depends on the country and also depends on the uh, stage of economic development. When you are in the developing country uh, where you need uh, uh, industrialization urgently, you should uh, put more emphasis on applied uh, technology. That's what we did in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are more advanced, and then uh, if you become a responsible uh, uh, member of this advanced country, oh, we should think about contributing to the human uh, the, uh, knowledge as of a, of a human being. So we should focus, we, we can study more on the, uh, the origin of the universe, origin of life and things like right. that. So I think the Korea is developing in that uh, level that uh, at the beginning, when uh, the Co Korea Institute of Science Technology was founded in 1966, actually, you might know that this was helped by the United States. And the suggestion at the moment at the, from the United States was that it should be modeled after Bell Lab. Mm -hmm. But the Korean government and uh, Chi hyung so who was the founding president, said, no, 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 no. We need more industrial uh, technology more urgently now. So he, they, they chose Battelle Memorial Institute model. Mm -hmm. So they contract uh, research with the industry and they develop uh, the industrial technology. Mm -hmm. And but Choi hyung so who was the founding president, said in his memoir that if the country has more wealth and developed, we should uh, establish an institution like a Bell Lab. I think that's what this, uh, IBS is like. Yeah, I see. So I see. it depends on the uh, uh, stage of development, I think. Mm -hmm. Let me bring in Professor Novosela. <laughs> Your um, the alma mater is in Russia, Moscow. 
And then you did some work in Netherlands as well, and then University of Manchester. So you've, you've seen the range of different uh, government intentions maybe and, and their uh, environment. Uh, how would you react to the, to the question of the right balance between the fundamental and applied sciences? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm really impressed with this panel, in, including myself. We're so uh, self-confident and seriously discussing the balance between, between the applied and the fundamental science, like we can control it. <laughs> can we? I don't, I, 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 like what? Next, so next panel is going to be how many discoveries do we need to make for the next five-year plan, or what? So I, I don't think the, uh, the, that you can, you can do something about, do anything about this, this balance. It just, it, just, it just exists. Of course, on, on a short-term period, you can probably, so, and then you can um, put uh, you know, grants in, in China that everyone studies, photovoltaics or in Australia, so you can push a certain direction. But then globally, uh, I, do, I really don't, don't know why, but science got these global characteristics that it can uh, self-correct its own mistake. It has, and, and it, it also this, I think it's a global characteristic of science that it, it, it maintain uh, the right balance between, between um, the fundamental and applied, at least on the on the long term run. So, mm -hmm. if discoveries are made are, are meant to be to be done, they're going to they're going to be done, and, and I, I don't think you can prevent or actually much accelerate uh, accelerate those. But on the short term, I I completely agree. You can push uh, certain uh, certain directions and indeed so you can so that that happened in in many countries and uh, including Korea or so I'm in Singapore now in, in so in UK there were uh, so some fields were completely killed some some fields were uh, uh, were, were, were promoted um, but again on the long term I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it just maintains the, the balance by itself mm -hmm. Professor, no, though. Uh, I think you mentioned somewhere that uh, the basic science is, in, in terms of funding, driven um, in, in big degree by the government funding. Right. So if the government allocates a lot of budgets, then it will be a, more of a stimulus to uh, basic science. And on, on the other side would be also true. So in terms of that, so the, the, the government probably has uh, some direction in mind. Right, right. Like Constantine has said that there's nothing, it seems there's nothing much that scientists or science uh, aspiring students can, can do to get the, the right balance. But I think uh, for governments, I mean, it's easier to, to persuade uh, that uh, general public or the policy makers or decision makers uh, to support applied science uh, for a shorter period of economic return. So it's, it's easier to support that because the government wants a big growth, right? Economic growth. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, but uh, companies, do spend lots of money uh, to research and development as well to develop their their products. So it's the 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 responsibility I think of the government to get the right balance to to support uh, basic fundamental science so that it can be transferred in the long term to companies and to other front front lines of, of developing products. So I mm -hmm. think it's the role of government to support a long-term uh, investment to the, the, the very difficult task of, of supporting without getting an immediate economic return. I think that's mm -hmm. the, the role of, of government. I see. Yeah. Uh, I think what one should do is one should give autonomy to the scientists. So the government should not interfere too much because the government cannot decide what, is imp what, what important discoveries are to be made or not to be made. 
One example which comes to my mind is uh, an example from basic biology, basic bacteriology is the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 mm -hmm. system, which is right. used by bacteria to fight infection by viruses. And now this, uh, d this discovery is used to correct uh, genetic diseases in humans and to improve plants. And a number of companies have been found that we have already a billion dollar value, uh, value on, on, the, on, on the stock market. And there's a clear example where well, that unexpected discovery, can, we cannot, which cannot be predicted, have a tremendous consequences for, for all of us. Right. Right. Uh, penicillin is another example. Internet is another example. Um, right. Like, like he mentioned, I mean, in CRISPR cas system, yeah. the so-called genetic scissor system yeah. for gene editing could not be possible if uh, the, the g governmental support of the, the useless uh, uh, research on bacterial repetitive sequences and how that works and how that is needed to combat a virus uh, attack. I mean, mm -hmm. apparently that look useless to make any money. But from that basic knowledge came that CRISPR-Cas uh, gene, gene editing system, which is, I think it's, it's the, it revolutionized not only biological research, researches, but also applied to, to all different fields, right? Yeah. Right, and there, there are examples plenty. I mean, right, transistors, right, you know, right. again. Sure. Uh, but isn't it true, though, it might be a sensitive subject, but maybe Professor Novoselov, um, there are a little bit of tension between the applied community and the basic science communities. And there, there has been, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say even bickering, but it, it seems like there is a different orientations and motivations in going into those fields. But they do have to work together uh, as a normative statement. What do you think would be a good policy. Well, it was already mentioned several times here that the big, the big problem here is where do you, where do, do you put the boundary? And this boundary is, first of all, is, is very difficult to put and it is very, very blurred. And for me, I would say that um, there is certain uh, fundamental knowledge which, uh, cannot, which, which cannot be patented or which, we, which cannot be uh, uh, just put into Personal, personal use. You cannot imagine Maxwell equations or Schrodinger equation to be to be patented. So, so then no one else is uh, is using it, right? So, certain um, uh, certain knowledge have to be and uh, to be uh, to be distributed. And I think it's really one of the fundamental rights for people that uh, to know. So that any discovery of this level should be given to the to humanity, it should be one of those fundamental rights, like the right to to, to live, the right to believe, and the, the right to to eat, and, and so on. But mm -hmm. um, indeed, there is then there is a there is a question uh, where to um, what's the relation between the the applied and the fundamental? And um, I mean, tensions. I'm I'm not sure. Of course, there are we each. Look, each scientist believes that his field is the best, and, uh, and his <laughs> his discoveries are the most. Right. Uh, the most. Uh, there is no scientist who would say, "Oh no, no." So his his science is much better. No, the, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't happen this way. But uh, maybe what is what is ugly. What what I I personally dislike when when um, this uh, uh, the uh, the prioritization of, of knowledge uh, gets, uh, uh, impedes the, the further progress. And it, it doesn't happen that often, but, but, it, but, but we do know those, those examples. And then a lot of money needs to be spent on, 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 on pushing those boundaries and allowing this, this, this progress uh, to happen. So that's probably more, more dangerous, at least in a short term run. Right. <clears throat> Professor O, um, I, I think that there is a little bit of consensus that the, the artificial kind of distinction between the E's are not really significant. But uh, nonetheless, universities have different departments and they have some tensions. In, in terms of innovating or uh, stimulating uh, the, the, the collaborations and, 
and getting rid of meaningless distinctions. Has there been any attempt to make it a kind of a, a task of the university to make it so? Well, sure. I mean, the, I think in Korea, universities try to break down the barriers between disciplines and departments. Uh, the reason is that you all know that the, uh, the world is changing very fast and the technology is changing very fast. So if you, are, if you learn the really current top of the world uh, technology today, in five years from now, it's not really top technology. Mm -hmm. So we talked about research uh, here, mostly research, but we think we should think about education differently. That the, uh, the students graduate, uh, the university students in, in the university, uh, well, should they learn applied uh, technology or basic fundamental technology, fundamental knowledge? I think it should be, my personal view is about uh, eight to, to two uh, favoring fundamental knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even you are working in the uh, semiconductor industry, the uh, maybe second law of thermodynamics is more important than uh, the uh, the current technology ten years from now. Mm -hmm. if you, even if you are working in the industry, so uh, because it's changing and you have to adapt to new new knowledge. So, in the university at education level, uh, you should focus more even in engineering department on fundamental knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think one effect of government supporting basic science is the manpower training for the future. So basic science uh, is more fundamental science is mostly done in universities and that helps to train future manpower. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should think about that as well. I see, okay. We, we got about two minutes left of what? Uh, the last question I want to give each of you is what kind of advice would you give to the students who are looking at this field and uh, I need to decide whether to go one way or the other? I mean, if there are not much distinctions, what would be a criteria you would suggest that they make decision on? Okay, my suggestion would be that the student should choose what he likes most, what is most interested in. But this, uh, I think, is... Uh, Best reason for success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So follow your passion. Follow your passion. <laughs> right. Yeah. Go ahead. I was relieved when uh, Dr. Kinam Kim from Samsung Electronics says that university education is still very needed. I was relieved. And I think uh, uh, in the university, I think students uh, can just I mean, explore uh, new areas and from what they've learned until high school, middle school, high school. So I think they can be open to any uh, opportunities. So I think I hope students to have a very open-minded and to change uh, whatever they've been thinking so far, I mean, to change after they, they go to university, if, if uh, chances permit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Professor uh, As I mentioned, that in universities, students should try to learn more about fundamental knowledge rather than current uh, applied uh, technology. For example, if you look at AI, AI is very popular now, uh, but the real breakthrough always comes from mathematics. So you should, even if you are working, uh, majoring in studying in uh, AI, you should not forget mathematics <laughs> <laughs> in universities. No, Professor Novoselic, you have the last word. Right, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would echo Michael here. So uh, the, the, the message to the students would be don't listen to the panel. Just, don't, <laughs> don't, just follow, follow exactly your, your heart and just, just do, do, do what you like. So just, it's really, is the worst possible thing you can do is to, is to jump on the, on the bank, on the bandwagon or, or to, 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 to do something which is fashionable at the moment. So follow your heart and don't, don't be afraid to, to change subject from time to time to really figure out what you want. Science is huge and mm -hmm. there are discoveries to, to be made in 
all, all possible areas. Great. Uh, I, I think that the, the best advice is that sometimes you have to ignore what all people say. <laughs> <laughs> but another, I think the prevailing theme is that follow your passion. I, I, I think that that's a, a success uh, ingredient for everybody. Join me in congratulating and also thanking Thank the you. panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And yeah, ignore what you like, but don't ignore the fact that you need to be back here at 3.10 after the coffee break. See you then. Welcome back. It's lovely to see you again. So for the rest of the afternoon, we're going to concentrate on the future of science and technology. We're going to have a number of panels, and we're going to begin with a panel on teaching scientific creativity. That will be moderated by uh, Kyung Ryul Park from KAIST. Um, two of the panelists you already know, Sejong Oh and Moon Jung Park. And then there will be two new panelists. One is Banu Jaina from Wayne State University, who's very kindly visiting. And the other is Joachim Frank, who is the 2017 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, so our fifth Nobel Laureate. Um, please, Kyung, t take a seat. Now, Thanks one thing um, the the, is alphabetical seating order, so if you can work that out. <laughs> so maybe Joachim and Banu and yeah. personnel. So one thing that you might not know about Joachim Frank is, apart from his, uh, from his creativity in scientific fields, he's also a photographer and a creative writer. And he puts, I think it's true to say, as much effort into creative writing, into writing literary fiction, as he does into his science. And if you want to take a look, you can look it up on franksfiction.com. And it's Franks <laughs> with an X, franksfiction.com. Um, over to you, Kyung. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for your order. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this wonderful uh, session titled Teaching Scientific Creativity. My name is Park kyung uh, I'm a faculty member of KAIST. Uh, in this session, we particularly focus on creativity, Chang and how to teach scientific creativity. So it seems we have a you know, a lot of um, you know, students, young students here today. So I'd like to ask, can creativity taught in school? How do you think? Or is um, creativity cultivated through a very rigorous uh, training um, like South Korean students here? Or is it just coming from um, exploration or uh, embracing mistakes, any type of uh, trials, errors? So in order to explore this very fundamental questions. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce our wonderful uh, group of distinguished speakers, actually, who need very little introduction today. So, so let me start with the Nobel laureate, um, Joachim. And how do you define scientific creativity, and how would you teach it? Yeah, when, um, when you posed the question to me on email, uh, mm -hmm. I immediately thought about a book that was recently published uh, by a Columbia um, professor, uh, a woman named Sheena, and I can't remember her last name. And it was uh, about Think Bigger. And in, in it, uh, she addresses uh, the question of uh, what, what, what is innovation, how we can define it in all fields, not just in science. But applied to science, it, I would, I would uh, paraphrase it in the following way. If you have a, a given problem that you absolutely want to solve, then the first approach is to divide it into sub-problems um, that individually has have, to, have to be solved in the course. Then for each sub-problem, you simply look w everywhere, everywhere, not just in science, everywhere for some kind of a similar sub-problem uh, that, uh, that have been solved already. You know, so so the recognition of these analogies, uh, analogies, uh, is absolutely crucial, um, which means, which really means that um, uh, one of the uh, one of the crucial assets uh, of scientists is that uh, 
uh, to, to think in metaphors. And um, so, uh, just to carry it to the end, uh, once you have now the, the sub-problems already solved in other fields, then you make, make one big uh, synthesis. Uh, but, the, but the importance of thinking in metaphors means that, um, uh, well, uh, if you look at this entire three-step pro uh, process, um, you, you, can, you could think that cre creativity and innovation can be taught uh, because you can simply tell people to uh, look at their problem in, in, in the same way and, and, do, uh, and, and <coughs> uh, look, uh, look at, at, at the same problem in a very wide way and not in a very narrow way. Mm -hmm. and, and my own experience uh, in, in my own field is that this is exactly how I got um, a, a, to, the, to the solution uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the grand problem. Right, and um, this is really important to you mentioned about kind of, you know, interdisciplinary approach and the for the scientific creativity as well. So, over to you, Banu. Uh, you've been pioneer uh, in the intersection between science and also industrial innovation. So, what is your thought on the uh, creativity? Well, I think <coughs> you can point it in all these sessions we have been discussing about learning, learning knowledge we should not actually mix uh, back and forth knowledge and creativity because there are two different attributes mm. in humans. Knowledge is, we have that, we learn throughout life. You know? And I'll give you a good example. Knowledge is, say for example, you know the alphabet, and then you learn about words and world build building and then throughout life you develop vocabulary, some you lose, some you gain over time. Creativity is taking those words and putting them in right context so you can make powerful poetry and prose. That's creativity. And creativity, unlike knowledge, which is a continuous process, develops very early on in life. So you can have even a farmer who was raising sheep in the middle of the desert become a very top-notch mathematician mm. at MIT. And I've discussed this with her Dudley Hirschbach so many times for many years. So the idea that we are struggling with is how do we teach students? We teach students to be creative. AI and other elements are just tools that will allow us to get access to factual information. That is not creativity. AI can allow us to get factual information. Therefore, the human touch, the deep knowledge that one would gain, the critical analysis, is, will lead to creativity, discoveries and inventions. And so uh, I would say that a creative individual is, as you can put it, you can take a complex problem, break it down into its parts, design and develop programs to solve each of those parts to learn the whole, or have very disparate ideas and put them together and make sense out of something that we still don't understand make understanding possible. So that will lead to innovation and discovery, creativity. Right, I, I think you, you raise a very important question on the how we can actually reconceptualize the creativity in the era of AI, but we'll come back to these very important questions. And President Oh, um, you have a, you know, extensive leadership experiences in higher education, and what are the roles of universities um, in setting up the environment for you know, cultivating creativity? Mm. Right. Uh, I think first of all, we should consider the question whether creativity can be taught at all. <laughs> and some people say that, think, might think that the uh, creativity is inherited by genes, <laughs> but uh, uh, developed by education. For example, if you uh, think of 
people like Einstein or Steve Jobs with great new ideas. You call them genius with gifted talent. And they might think, we might think that there might be something special in their brains. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's why the, the brain of Einstein is preserved for a long time. I hope you're a little bit demoralized. <laughs> uh, they, 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 they found that uh, there's nothing special about the brain, <laughs> physio physiologically. But, uh, but so uh, many people think that the, uh, the creativity cannot be taught, but it, it should be uh, inherited by gene. But my uh, personal opinion is that that's not true. Everybody has uh, his own creativity. Uh, and for example, some people are uh, really good, uh, is really good at soccer or chess, or some people are really good with AI or mathematics. Uh, so, but different people have different creativity, and, but we can think of an environment, educational environment, which uh, the individual can discover their creativity or uh, help him or her reveal the creativity. Uh, so I think the question you, may, you posed to me uh, was, uh, we can <coughs> rephrase it by saying that the, how can we provide environment that is very helpful to reveal or discover individual's creativity? I think there are some uh, rules and ways to do that. Uh, I, I can talk about it later, I think. Thank you, Faris. Um, everyone, everybody has their own individual um, creativity. It's a very powerful um, sentence from President Oh, so, so Professor Park Moon Jung, in this panel, you happen to be uh, the youngest uh, academic. <laughs> so do you find a lot of differences between your own generation and your students, and how this affect um, your teaching? Um, my a personal experience, uh, when I was a student more than 20-something years ago, um, teaching was uh, more like one-way teaching. Now, as you know, both we are communicating, I think the next generation teaching, we actually we taught by students. We learn you know, by itself. So that, that's a big difference. So uh, in my, just, I want to de define uh, scientific creativity as uh, you uh, are uh, able to see some phenomena with your own perspective, some different perspective. That is still very you are creative, but more creative way is you try to solve that problem using unconventional method, and then, then you are more creative. So in that case, in many cases, that connected to serendipity observation, you know, that innovate, innovate the technology and, and scientific knowledge. So how to teach? And in, in my personal experience, I always talk to my student uh, in my lab, uh, most important finding never come from my brain, never came from my idea because I'm not that smart. And uh, I'm only good at uh, is uh, when I see some most unexpected result, mm -hmm. I never dismiss. I put them on my desk. Mm -hmm. I try to see it every morning, try to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's my job. Mm -hmm. But once I meet a good student mm -hmm. who never lose their curiosity mm -hmm. about sometimes disappointing result, and, and we can have a, some synergy. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of action also one of the creative mm -hmm. thing we can do in academia, we can do in laboratory. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I always emphasize, I always encourage my students try to listen some other person's seminar who working on different field. That's the way you can refresh yourself. So you know, I have to confess myself in my professional career, most important innovation was actually not from my idea, it's, it's inspired by listening to other people's seminar who are in totally different research fields. So for example, I'm a chemist, and, and, and we developed the so-called ice chemistry to develop better polymer 10 years ago. And that idea actually driven by one small seminar. I, I was attending seminar by a geologist who was explorer of the South Pole. And I was listening to his talk, and I got an idea, oh, I can use that for my polymer synthesis. So that becoming very important finding. So, uh, you know, I think uh, you know, scientific creativity drive at the intersection of different discipline because that's the way you connect idea from the diverse field, and that's the way actually we can teach creativity. Very impressive comments. 
Um, so back to the bonus, um, you know, the questions on the uh, uh, how we can actually conceptualize creativity in the era of artificial intelligence, and we also had a very interesting um, session in this uh, afternoon. So uh, how do you uh, think about human creativity in the era of uh, artificial intelligence? And do you see generative AI uh, getting a Nobel Prize uh, in the near future? Maybe we might just want to have uh, some, some uh, comments from the audience. Um, just raise your hand. Do you see that you know, the, uh, the AI um, are getting a Nobel Prize in a recent future? Yes. <laughs> raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> Right? Never. AI cannot beat human mm -hmm. being. Whoa, okay. I was actually expecting like 50 50, but it seems like, you know, uh, more than 60 or 70% um, for no. Um, so it's very interesting. How would you respond to um, this, you know, uh, result? How would you have thought of it? Respond to the poll? Or yeah, or maybe your own uh, uh, conceptualization. Well, it, it uh, really expresses my own feeling. <laughs> Uh, so um, I, I think uh, AI uh, is, is vastly overrated, uh, and uh, in, in, in terms of uh, being able to emulate uh, human uh, <coughs> uh, imagination, uh, and uh, so I, I expect uh, AI to be a uh, very useful tool uh, because it ha can access uh, knowledge in a way that uh, no human can. Uh, it can also, um, you know, solve problems uh, very, uh, <coughs> very well. Uh, but um, the, uh, what I brought up before, this thinking in metaphors, now these metaphors, these analogies, are really, um, <coughs> they encompass the vast uh, universe of, of of human knowledge, and their analogies, their analogies with which are uh, maybe they're ingrained in the language, uh, they are uh, in in uh, some kind of historical uh, parallels and so forth. You know, you think about this entire universe of analogies that that's a, 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 at our fingertips as humans, mm -hmm. and I'm really not sure whether this can ever be achieved by AI. Over to you, Bruno. Well, <clears throat> I have two comments to make. One is uh, talking about uh, creativity and first how it is, how can it be taught because panelists explain their perspective. And I would say this, when a child is given a Lego block and the child is able to put this Lego block together, it is using its intellect and developing it to put the Lego block together the way he or she wants to put it, or even a zigzag puzzle that they solve, or even a pencil and paper that they draw. So the idea of getting better at teaching creativity is giving the opportunity to that individual at a very early age to explore. And I think that is creativity. And that is important. So as Joachim pointed out, uh, AI is a powerful tool, like any other tool in, as we develop more, you had computers. So the, there's an explosion of knowledge or factual information. What is dangerous is if the child is passively learning things and has little time to explore on their own using those tools, then it is detrimental to mm -hmm. say. Then you don't have creativity. You have lost creativity. And therefore, the interaction with faculties, student interaction with faculty, direct interaction all the time, uh, if that is lost, then you don't have that didactic teaching mm -hmm. experience. I'm talking about the college levels, okay? Mm -hmm. So AI absolutely is very powerful. It brings us so much knowledge in our fingertips. You know, physicians don't have to go and find a, a, cert for certain, a certain drug for a certain disease. We don't have to memorize that. And our brains are, have limited cap capabilities. To, we forget few things, we learn few things, yeah? 
but creativity is created very early in life. It is not genetic. It can actually happen to anyone, as I said. It can happen, and depending on the exposure the individual gets. So we should see in a positive light that as human beings, we have many more miles to go before AI takes over. <laughs> AI is never going to take over human life, and human intellect is the key for human, not only survival, but growth. Yeah. With that, should you offer everyone coding education? Yoakim Murupanu, any thoughts on that? Should you offer you know, everyone coding education in, like, for example, primary education? To those, those are important things. They should learn how to code, they should learn how to do this, but they should have their own, in other words, they are being taught the capability to use new technology, but they should not be having technology rule their lives. Mm. That's what I'm meaning to say. Sure. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think part of your comments also addressed not just AI, but, uh, but the digital, digital yes. learning yes. process, mm -hmm. uh, which is passive learning, uh, which is uh, really uh, uh, learning that, that doesn't work, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I, uh, uh, in earlier panel discussions, uh, digital learning was uh, praised and, and uh, it was thought that it should be encouraged and I am very, very skeptical about mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Sure. I agree. Okay. President O, yeah. Right? yeah. Well, I, I do think AI itself can be creative, mm. but I think it can be, can be a very useful tool for creative thinking. Uh, as Professor Pam mentioned, that usually new ideas, very creative ideas, come at the boundary of disciplines mm. and from the diversity, from uh, a different view, point of views on the same subject, topic. So, but, but, but and AI can collect information from vast fields of study and from best uh, authors. So uh, they can collect all those uh, different views on some topic. Then the humans can look through it and find their own, combine all these things and can come up, can come up with great new ideas. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, AI can be a very useful tool for creativity and we can actually teach how to be creative using AI to students. But AI yeah, itself probably cannot be creative. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my feeling is. Sure. Unjo? Yeah, same is. So, you know, I'm, I'm computer dumb, so my answer will be <laughs> highly biased. Uh, but uh, 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 I think AI is a tool to save my time. So I can spend my time on, on other important things by taking advantage of the AI. But uh, you know, teaching creativity to me same sentence as cultivating curiosity. Mm. AI can cultivate curiosity, particularly in the early childhood. I don't think so. You know, that's mostly between human, you know, by parent, by teacher, communicating, and how we can support their failure, how we can support their risk taking, mm. and that cultivate curiosity. And I don't know how can AI can do this. So I'm very you know negative on the, that aspect. But as a tool for the future uh, our society, it's very useful. You know. Again, I'm, I'm highly biased, so you know, maybe some, someone uh, go against my statement, but I think so, yeah. Sure. We're, uh, we're actually getting into the very wonderful discussion, but we are also running out of time, so I'd like to open up the floor for um, a couple of questions or comments. So if you have a, a fascinating idea to share or questions, please raise your hand. Sure. Uh, gentleman over here. Uh, thank you for your great comments. And I have a question to Dr. O. Uh, is the creativity generated by human by the previously learned like knowledge? Then the, if AI generates the new thing from the learned knowledge, is it AI having a creativity? Well, uh, <laughs> it's more like uh, who is the intellectual owner of the property. <laughs> uh, 
Well, actually, AI can provide previous knowledge. But I think creativity uh, actually manifests itself by combining different facts and make a new ideas. So that's, I think that can be done only by humans. I, AI can collect all the information, but from all this uh, information, uh, you, make, you can make a leap forward to produce new ideas. That's the creativity, and I think that can be done only by humans at the moment. I'm not sure uh, 10 years from now AI can be very developed and uh, maybe may have the ability to leap forward, but at the moment uh, it's probably uh, difficult to do that. Banu and Joachim, if you, if you have any thoughts on that, um, right to Well, I think, <clears throat> as we all discussed, I think it is uh, factual information, which is knowledge. Mm -hmm. As we grow as a society, it is exploding in geometric proportion, and it is being caught up by helping, electronics is helping us, and AI and machine learning, these are helping us to do, to some extent, get this information to us it is also working as an information filter. So, you know, this so overwhelming amount of information is generated that AI can be used to filter out what you want. Uh, as Professor Levitt and others pointed out, you can actually select. But AI is not going to bring to you new discoveries and inventions. It's going to help you. It's a tool. Mm -hmm. So creativity is going to do that. And therefore, that is lacking in a machine human beings, machines cannot replace <laughs> human, the human mind. Yeah, I think the fundamental um, you know, human potential for any type of creativity, like art-related creativity, actually, Joachim is you're also a writer, and also scientific creativity is a kind of uh, a defining characteristic of human beings and you know, our species. So I think that's... Uh, I would like to make a minor sure, point, sure. very yeah. quickly. Uh, in fact, in our schools, creative teaching is more in the arts than in the mm, sciences. Mm, mm, mm. Because the art student is able to draw, given a paper to draw, or architectural yes. is able to do this. And science students should get more didactic teaching and more laboratory hands-on mm. experience for a creative type of environment. Mm. I just sure. wanted to make that. Sure. I believe we kind of touch, touched upon like very fundamental um, issues on human creativity this uh, session. So thank you very much for our panelists and then huge thanks to the audience. Uh, let's have a round of big applause for our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. So one of our panelists in our next panel is Michael Levitt. And since he was the person who early, earlier told us to love uh, GP, G, GPT, I thought he, we better get his comments on whether AI is going to be awarded a Nobel Prize at some point. So um, I think one issue with Nobel Prizes are that they usually go to no more than three people. And uh, I think it would be quite difficult to find the three people. <laughs> You could say AI is just one person, but actually it's a, a disembodied figure. So I think uh, Nobel rules seem to be quite strict. Um, and uh, huge organizations that were critical in discovering things often didn't get acknowledged because there were more than three. So I don't know. Um, you know, the Lasker Prize went to a small subset of uh, AI. Um, you know, you could argue that one of the main objectives of Nobel Prizes is to take people to be, met, to be role models for other people. And it's not clear that ChatGPT with a Nobel Prize would be any more impressive as a role model. <laughs> it might be very important for other large language models to look up to. Yeah, but I wonder whether the committees select Nobel laureates on the basis that they'll make good role models. I don't think that comes into the consideration. They don't make it into consideration, but many, many laureates feel the obligation. Oh, yes because they themselves had Nobel laureates as role models. Mm. So it's a way of paying it forward. Um, I'm not sure if a machine would feel the same way. <laughs> and in some ways, uh, one of the important things about a, a Nobel laureate as a, as a role model 
is that, you know, he dresses in a certain way, he likes sports cars, or he doesn't, he has girlfriends, or he doesn't, boyfriends, and this is what makes them more, more human. And I think that we really want to encourage more people to become scientists. We don't need to encourage ChatGPT, because it's going to happen anyway. Mm. Yeah, I, I, that's, it's lovely that you point that out, because I always feel that one of the things that I discover about Nobel laureates is how different you all are. You, in, you know, you might look a little similar in that most Nobel laureates, unfortunately, still are older white men. Mm -hmm. But inside, you're very different people, I think. But I think, you know, any hundred... Well, in fact, I worked out how many Nobel laureates are alive today. Mm -hmm. It's actually a difficult question to find. So I first asked all the chat boxes, and they all got it wrong. The actual number is 280, and maybe one or two less given <laughs> recent deaths. But uh, that's a small number, yeah. in including all the prizes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, you know, it's a representative group. I'm not sure how representative it is, but people are different. Every, you know, it, if you talk to anybody, you would find they're very, very different. Yeah, that's true. It's worth exploring everybody. That's absolutely right. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Right, please take a seat. Should, and, where should um, I sit? Uh, that's a good question. Let's get everyone else on first. So this is... <laughs> um, this panel uh, is going to be moderated by Ryan Song, and it's going to feature Anna Dadio and Jung Hae No, who you've met before, and also a new panelist, Mimi Bong, who is a professor of educational psychology from Korea University. Uh, so, let's work out the seating. Um, Mimi, I think you're here. Okay. Anna. jung -hye. And then Mike, you're at the end. Okay. Or maybe I got that wrong, but anyway. Um, so, Anna, uh, Anna mentioned to me at coffee break, it's surprising that nobody has yet talked very much about gender. And now is the chance to talk about gender and all sorts of other diversity. So, over to you. Indeed. This is a session on diversity. The importance of diversity cannot be overstated. It was once said that uh, all evolutions come from diversity. It follows from the all innovations come from diversity. We're not just talking about uh, gender diversity. We could talk about the racial diversity, uh, economic disparities and all those. But it is true there has been uh, traditionally underrepresented groups. I don't think this is a session to pat ourselves on how, how good a job we've done. There are <laughs> no. challenges remaining. That's why we are here. So we'll try to talk about how to make it better. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Dadio, uh, from a vantage point of UNESCO, I mean, you might have a broader view, but over the years, how far have we come in terms of uh, getting better diversity, and where are we now? Thank you. So I think there is no one-fits-all model, and the countries have had a different path towards progress in this area. On average, we may think that the uh, latest data suggests that uh, only one-third of the graduates uh, of uh, STEM uh, major, majors were female. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, this is a progress when uh, we uh, started from very low level. Uh, but there are huge differences across countries. For instance, you look at countries like Malaysia, where 43% of the graduates are STEM graduates, because there is one thing. We can talk about STEM graduates, and then within the STEM graduates, uh, we can look how many of these graduates are diverse. And mm -hmm. as you said, we are not just talking about women, we are talking about uh, other sources of diversity. So even in countries like Malaysia, where you have 43% of graduates in STEM, you know that uh, only 10% are women. Mm -hmm. So we have gone far. I mean, I would like to put a kind of uh, a word of optimism because uh, that's important to, to say that there has been progress. But we are very far from being where we need to be. And even because it's not just to look at the STEM graduates, it's to look how they choose the subjects during the course. If we, th if, um, if we think about women, girl, 
uh, we realized that uh, looking at the, 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 the latest team's data, uh, um, the trends uh, in uh, international study of mathematics, uh, um, we see that uh, um, grade eight boys are much more likely to choose STEM subjects than girls. So, mm -hmm. of course, when you look at the graduates, uh, you, you look at those that live with a degree, but how they decide to get there, I think this is a question. Why, and not only the question, we were talking yesterday with Adam, the fact that there are many people that even if they graduate in STEM, they are not able to, to make the transition on the labor market. So one point is how, d how to get there, and uh, the policies and the intervention are very different uh, across countries. Mm -hmm. it, it may be giving confidence to girls. It can be um, uh, really insisting on, insisting, insisting on the importance of the role models. It can be about curricula, but it's not something that there is not just one intervention, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, progress is there, but we need to do much more, especially when we talk about diversity, because there are, I would say that parents are uh, maybe the key influencer when we talk about uh, uh, the probability for young people and women, especially girls, to uh, start a career, a, a study path in, uh, in STEM subjects. And mm -hmm. I, would, uh, mm -hmm. I would add that maybe one important uh, change is the fact that we are moving from STEM to STEAM. So the STEM with arts and uh -huh. arts and creativity. So there, are, I see. there have been changes in the way STEM are taught to just to give more space to diversity in it. I see. The same question, but the context of Korea, uh, Professor No. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is happening? I agree with Anna that it has been uh, better, but the progress is still very slow, I think. And for example, in Korea, the 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 portion of women students, girls student, female students in uh, science and engineering departments in the university is about 30%. And I think it's lower than we expect, and it's lower than uh, the major universities in Asia, uh, top major universities. For example, in Singapore, it, it's 40, more than 40%. So I think there, there, there's more to go. So I think, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. still there's a less amount, less, yeah, number of, of, of female right. students in science and engineering. Yeah. Professor Levitt, we, we talk about, it seems like you're uh, always talking about the technology aspect of it. Um, STEM subjects, be, because of the, the particularities of the subject matters, that, does that have uh, bearings on the diversity question itself? And also, the second part of it is whether technology will make it better or the, we are influence it enough. So before I answer on that, I want to reinforce what you said about biology really favoring diversity. People tend to think about survival of the fittest. Not true. True for bacteria, but all other organisms that are interesting have a mother and a father. Mm. And mm. the diversity comes from the difference between the mother and the father. So I think it's really important that diversity, and biology is a pretty smart thing. It created all of us so we can learn from biology. So I think diversity being really important is true. And if you go against that for nationalistic reasons, for reasons of male superiority, you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, to get to the, the details, I, I think that uh, we cannot forget the legacy. Science has been a male-dominated field for a very, very long time. And things, I mean, the fact that we still talk about chemistry, physics, mathematics, just shows how old and how, old, how long it takes to change things. Uh, I got a Nobel Prize in chemistry 
the one subject I have never ever studied is chemistry. Mm -hmm. I studied physics, I love computers, I'm involved in, in biology. So it just shows that these definitions are, are wrong, and these definitions still work against women. Science is too much about you know, the, so the sole wolf male standing up against you know, the, f the outside forces and doing something, whereas in reality, collaboration, working together, is much more important. So I think mm -hmm. we still need uh, a lot of development in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. the subjects themselves, I, I don't see anything that men can do that women can't do, and vice right. versa. Um, you know, I, uh, it seems to me that even just from a simple numerical perspective, the fact that women are not given equal opportunities yes. costs the country a great deal. And maybe in the past, when we didn't need as many people in technology and science and computer science and so on, we could afford to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think in these times when we have a lot of problems to solve, we can't afford to waste talent. So I think from all these points of view, uh, changes need to be made. And in fact, just thinking about this, you know, the Nobel Foundation tends to favor the sole wolf who you know, stands up against the winds, a very male model. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that needs to also change. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I definitely believe enormously in diversity. Now I'm starting to talk about, you know, I sort of say in the beginning there was man, some fit bacterial cell just saying how great he was. And then a woman came along and suddenly we had all this diversity. I mean, everything you can see is the result of men and women, mm -hmm. or man and female, ma man and female. But I think we can go one step further and have man and woman and machine, and actually have a three-way diversity that will even be more amazing. So that's sort of how I see evolution going. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, equality for women is, ex you know, is something we cannot afford not to do. Right, right. It, it seems like the, the biology can teach us a lot of you know, things I, I that should be done. We have AI and we have BI. BI. And BI is biological intelligence. Right, okay. <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I think. Did, did you have something to add? No, to, no, no, no okay. No. Um, we we're, were talking about diversity in different settings, and I, I think that the professor, oh, actually, uh, the, the, the Dr. Dadio mm -hmm. mentioned the parents. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the earlier sessions, uh, there, were, there was a, a maxim or, or credo says you should follow your passions, but many, especially Korean students, follow passions of their parents. Yeah, uh, it, it seems like that is either affecting or even hurting the diversity questions. What do you think? Um, thank you for the question. Before um, I answer that question, um, I think I overheard Michael talking about the importance of role model um, to increase diversity in STEM fields. So you can imagine how disappointed I was when I see there is no women Nobel, Nobel laureates visiting Seoul this year. <laughs> so, but I was relieved to see uh, Dr. Ro um, in the panel. So having said that, so parents and teachers are playing really critical role in adolescent and children and adolescents' decision whether or not they're going to enter STEM fields. I'm a motivation researcher, and the two factors that are really critical in one's decision making, whether, you, whether or not you want to do something or enter such a field, one is interest, and I cannot emphasize importance you know, any further, and the other is confidence, your confidence to be able to succeed once you choose to pursue your dreams. Mm -hmm. But it looks like for underrepresented groups in STEM, especially for girls, there are other factors as well. For girls, uh, the other factor actually is a hindrance, is gender stereotype. And what's interesting is that when I do research, and that that's true across the world, there is these days no significant difference in terms of STEM achievement between boys and girls. And in fact, there are, girls are actually performing better. Sorry, boys in the audience, but it's, it is fact. So g girls are actually uh, performing better on standardized tests. Mm -hmm. But still, they do not enter the STEM fields despite of their superior achievement. And one of the factors is the constant messages they receive explicitly or implicitly from the environment surrounding yes. them. One of the major social agents who are delivering those messages are parents. So. Um, it is interesting when we do surveys among students and parents and teachers, guess what? The younger students do not report gender stereotypes anymore. They pretty much overcome it. Mm. 
But when we do the survey among the parents, they still hold very strong gender stereotypes. In other words, Korean parents especially, they want their boys to be good at, in mathematics, for example. And they are so disappointed when they do not perform well in mathematics, whereas Korean parents are happy when their girls perform well in math. But when they don't do math as well, the degree of disappointment is not at much. So those are subtle messages. But children and adolescents are very sensitive about those messages. They know what are expected of them. And so I think, if I may share one recent research, when we teach parents about the pitfalls of holding these stereotypes and how that really blocks their children from developing further and reaching their potentials, that works. So I think you know, the goal of education is not only educating children, but also we have to do something with the parents and you know, try to change the culture of the society as, as well. So mm -hmm. one thing is just reduce gender stereotypes. There are other measures, but I'll talk about it later. Okay. May I say something? Sure. So, yeah, uh, and I think that, uh, as I was saying before, is not, is parents have a huge role, uh, they play a huge role, but uh, when we talk about the role model, there are teachers also, and female, f female mm, working in these sectors, and very often we see that they are, they where their intervention happens, so they go to school, they go to classroom, they can represent something important for the girls, for the students that look that these exist, they have a place in the workplace. And I would add uh, that in addition to stereotypes that are built within the family, and this is something that is very important, especially in countries that uh, have also this still these traditional values, the importance of seeing a man as a doctor and not uh, a female as a doctor, a female may be a nurse, but not necessarily a doctor. There is also the stereotype that are embedded in the textbook, in the curricula. I mean, the way uh, we have done a study some years ago about uh, how many times you could see a woman in uh, a male-dominated position, like being a doctor or an engineer in the textbook, and how many times you see a man or and, and we saw that women are generally represented in traditional roles. They see them cooking, they see them taking care of the kids, while the important professions are attributed in the textbook, uh, in the images, uh, in the example to men. So this is something that is very important in terms of what we can do about changing things. And one thing mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, there is increasing um, the, the importance of addressing STEM uh, subjects very early in life. So mm -hmm. the early you learn to deconstruct the, uh, the stereotypes uh, in early childhood education already, the early children, girls and boys, understand uh, that there is not a gender position, they will also be less influenced by their parents. Because I think this, we are talking about uh, deconstructing this these stereotypes uh, to improve. And we need that. If we think about artificial intelligence, the fact that algorithms are biased, uh, and there are a lot of bias, because who codes uh, are mainly white men, and there's been studies about who are the, cod the coders, the developers. Uh, there is no diversity in many cases in those who are behind uh, artificial intelligence development. Mm -hmm. So to be artificial intelligence, to, to want to have artificial intelligence that is diverse, we need to have professionals that are diverse in these subjects. Mm -hmm. right. Can I add Your one of, about um, the role of role mo model that Anna has brought out? That I, mean, I think it affects uh, female students a lot to see role model. And I think that will affect parents as well yeah. to see the success of, 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 of female uh, role models. And so uh, like in the national universities of Korea, there is uh, recently a movement of, of 
hiring more women faculties in the university mm -hmm. so that it could serve as a role, yes. role model. And for example, in College of Engineering at Seoul National University, about 15 women faculties out of 100, 320 male faculty, or whole, whole faculty. So it's less than 4%. And that's way below with other competitive Asian uh, top rated universities. And I think university is trying to make efforts to recruit mm -hmm. more, more women faculties, especially in the, the short list of women candidates to, to hire more. And I think that that will change, I mean, a little, yeah. yeah to mm -hmm. this trend. Yeah. Professor Navid, in, the, in reaching the highest level of achievement in, in, in the science, in the Nobel field, have you seen the kind of environment that, that steers one way or the other in terms of diversity that may be a kind of uh, affecting factor that we, we can improve upon? Well, I, I'm very... Uh, taken by the lack of role models. When, when you said this, and I, many of my uh, female colleagues have said, but we have no role models. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, a very important thing. Mm -hmm. um, before the session started, I was talking to, to Adam Smith on the stage, and he was suggesting that a Nobel Prize perhaps go to ChatGPT. And I would much rather it went to human women <laughs> a lot before. You know, the, the, the role model, in, in some ways you could say, you, you were saying that there are very few, there aren't any Nobel laureates for women. There's a small number of women Nobel laureates and they're an, in huge demand. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants them for, for good reason. So in some ways you could argue that the suitability for a Nobel Prize should be your discovery plus the impact of giving you the prize. Not for the past, but for the future. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that giving a Nobel Prize to an underrepresented field or individual has a much bigger impact. Mm -hmm. So this would mean a change, perhaps, of how they do things. But I do think that, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the effects of getting a Nobel Prize is that certain people then become more influential. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be thought about. And, and I think this is a way in which this could happen. But I would really be happy to see many, many more mm -hmm. role model women. Right. More mo role models. Probably the environment that we can, you know, best think of is either schools or workplace. Um, so in that sense, I, I don't know if you can make a regulation to force the workplace to hire more, but we probably have a better school policies mm -hmm. to but my, have my, that my wife, who is a, a strong lady, says that if there were more women leaders of countries, yes, exactly. we'd have a much, much, much better world. <laughs> that w okay, that we have an experience. I'm not sure, but I'll pause here. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. I, I was going to, to talk about uh, leadership, in fact, mm -hmm. because uh, role model is, uh, is important, but there is also leadership. And when we look about the number of women leaders, uh, there are not so many. And even in countries where there is this quota, so this, uh, um, le the, the, this legislation constraints in the number of uh, Women needed, for example, in the boards, in mm -hmm. the in the boards, so that there is an equal representation of men and women. This works because there is uh, something that uh, has been imposed and has changed the mentality. But this will not work everywhere. I think that we need really to think about. Uh, women leaders, not necessarily, not only, I would say, country leaders, but really how they can steer policies, legislations, and also uh, building a society. And mm -hmm. there are so few, and this is really important. Next report will be on leadership, and the way leader leadership is distributed is very important, because uh, what the literature shows is that women manage to distribute the leadership. Mm -hmm. So it means that you have not a hierarchical model where you have a leader. It is not about authority. It's about giving the example. And mm -hmm. uh, this is really about education, I think. 
And only having this kind of leadership capacity and skills, uh, you can change. You can change really the world. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think. Well, go going back to what parents want f from their children, probably they're in a way reflecting what the society is saying. Is whether it be a lack of role models yeah. mm -hmm. or the biases, the cultural baggages coming from. Um, so what's what's the solution? Uh, I mean, the, let, let's go focus on the, the the school. How we can kind of change in the environment, uh, Professor? No, I think it is. I think it's important to tell ourselves and to students at school, everybody else, that diversity is not just a, a thing, virtue to care for underrepresented people. It's not in that level. No. Diversity is a power, and it's mm -hmm. the source of innovation, and it's source of, of excellence mm -hmm. and creativity, because it can hold many different aspects of viewpoints from the different uh, experiences. So I think it is required, not only in science, the scientific community, but also as, as the whole society in general. So I think it's, it's very necessary to spread out that kind of message to okay. the world. Yeah. We got about one minute left. So one sentence, some student, female student who came to you and okay. said, well, in, in terms of diversity, I'm facing the headwind. Should I go into STEM field? Is that going to be okay for me in the future? What would you hear? I would say definitely yes. Yes, um, One has to, you know, headwinds have to be faced. And uh, I think that's part of being a good scientist. We, as I said, by not having diversity, we are crippling ourselves as humanity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's as serious as that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Snow? Yeah, same. Same. Yeah. yeah, I would say definitely mm -hmm. yes, and I will say something that is important also, the door is open. So if you need advice and counseling, come mm -hmm. to see someone that can help you, and don't think that uh, you, if you find a stereotype, uh, it's something that will block your way through education. So I think this is yes, yeah. definitely. You're not alone. <laughs> right? You are not alone, yes. <laughs> I'd like to w share one anecdote real quick. Um, mm -hmm. I had a student who is visually impaired. He cannot see. He couldn't see. And then he came to me and said, Professor, I wanted to pursue um, human resource development in graduate school. But everybody, wa everybody that I talked to uh, told me that you better go into either special education yeah, right. or social work. So I, t I asked him, so if I'm a woman, do I have to, be a, you know, do I have to study feminism? I mean, I studied something else, so follow mm -hmm. your dream. So he's now teaching in a tenured assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Mm -hmm. In other words, headwinds, you can overcome. Follow your fa passions. Yes. That'll be my, I guess, one-liner. Yes. Great. Great. Those Great. are the advices. Uh, join me in thanking the panel members on the diversity questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, um, our next moderator will be Kyung Rul Park, who you've met before. And I just thought we shouldn't let the opportunity pass of asking him about um, the digital technologies we were talking about earlier, because you work on the interface of policy and technology. And just earlier this week, you've been in New York talking to the UN General Assembly about the role of digital technologies in development. So, would you like to just give us your very brief reflections? Sure. Um, we had a um, United Nations General Assembly with a particular focus on SDGs, Global Sustainable Development Goals. It's actually um, every four years uh, since 2015. And there's uh, lots of discussions on uh, the roles of digital technologies in achieving these global uh, sustainable developments. Uh, but at the same time, we really, ne really need to engage um, you know, the discussion about uh, how we can actually implement uh, these technologies in the context of developing countries um, because you know, the, there's a lots of um, you know, ethical consideration and you know, institutional challenges, not only just institutional challenges, but also cultural challenges in the context of uh, developing countries. So, so when we discuss about uh, digital technologies or digital transformation, we really need to um, ask about digital transformation for whom and for what. So that's why we, uh, we need to um, work together with 
the people uh, in the ground. It's a collaboration. Yes, collaboration. Thank you. Supporting what many people have said before earlier today. So thank you very much indeed. Sure. Very thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Now, please take your seat. Sure. And sure. I will invite the other panelists to join us for this last uh, panel before the final panel, so the penultimate panel. This one is on what we need to tackle the grand challenges ahead. And listening to the panel that's just gone before us, I suppose one simple answer to that question might just be more female leaders. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the realization that the panel we're about to see is an all male panel, and for which I apologize. Uh, Gender it, equality. Some, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> some, sometimes when you're shuffling panelists around, this is what happens, but we, are rec we, we do recognize the fact this is all male. Anyway, joining you are George Smoot, sure. Hartmut Mikkel, Jules Razak, <laughs> and Passy Salberg. Please come in, seat yourselves as you will. <laughs> Welcome. Please. Anywhere? Where, anywhere. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Adam, um, and my panelists for your participation again. So this session, we focus on uh, global grand challenges um, and how science and technology can address uh, these challenges. So indeed, we have been experiencing um, you know, very uh, difficult times with a series of um, not only the economic downturn, but also uh, social environmental challenges, including climate crisis, and humanitarian crisis, as well as a global pandemic. But at the same time, we see uh, some sort of hopes of the future uh, and working together, uh, especially in, in the intersection between scientific community and also international collaboration. So we have been preparing this session within this kind of uh, global context of the times that we are overcoming together and working together. So that actually lays the foundation for today's discussion about uh, some of the thoughts and innovations from our um, distinguished panelists. So, without further delay, um, let's begin with Hartmut. Um, so, from your own view, uh, how would you uh, conceptualize the uh, um, grand challenges? Of course, first of all, we have to discuss what are the great challenges and grand challenges. And in my opinion, it is to understand ourselves. Yes. In order, if we understand ourselves, we can, we can at the end understand how much we can understand. So it's mainly an understanding of uh, how the brain, how our brain works, how our body works, for instance, and how memory is encoded, and whether do we, we do have a free will, mm -hmm. what is consciousness? It was there already we touch the border to philosophy. Sure. Yeah? So how would you, um, you know, um, um, what is your thoughts on then how we can actually utilize science and technology and or technology innovation to address these kind of you know, grand challenges? Actually, in, in, I think to understand the human body, we have to know each human protein. Mm -hmm. We have to know how many cell types, cell types there are. We have to know in which wow. cell type, which protein is produced. <laughs> and we have to uh, know how the tissues are formed and how the organs are formed and then how the body is formed. Mm -hmm. So this would be sec the, the sequential order. And uh, because there are 22,000 proteins in the human body, Still a lot of work, work has to be done, and I do not think that this would work without international collaboration. Sure. So we have to dis dis distribute the task. The Swedes already made a very good attempt uh, by uh, establishing the human cell atlas, and uh, in many international collaborators contribute to that. At the end, of course, we, we, also, of course, we also have to know how uh, the proteins changes, how the cells changes upon development and, uh, and during their function which is a, a very important aspect, which are difficult to study, in particular in the cellular context. And so we have to develop, still develop methods to, uh, to investigate all, this, uh, to, uh, all these problems. And at the end, if it comes to the brain, where we have also to understand why do we need to sleep, <laughs> uh, and, uh, th and, uh, and how do we encode the memory, it gets really, really difficult. We have to learn about connectivity, and people try to, do, to study connectivity by electron microscopic methods, by, by more and more, but and other different methods, uh, uh, using fluorescence techniques and things like this, but this is still, we are, way, uh, way, uh, we are not even very close to understanding that. Sure. So, um, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Mm. <laughs> well, let, let me start off from a different kind of an angle. When I look at industrial revolution in general, 
Uh, what are the great challenges? My, my take on this is the great challenges are what is left behind. For example, the first industrial revolution, at the end of the day, what do we get? We get pollution from the steam engine, you know? Mm -hmm. And that goes on to the second, the second uh, industrial revolution. We also got uh, the fragmentation of society. We've got child labor, we've got uh, slavery and all those sorts. Now in the third uh, industrial revolution, we've got uh, loneliness as an, an issue. <laughs> Th there is this downside of the Industrial Revolution that we have not understood very well. Of course, there are many things that we can glorify it, but all this downside l l is with us now. The pollution of the 300 years ago from the two Industrial Revolutions is still here, and we do not know how to solve them. And the question of loneliness, people are still grappling about it. What is it we're going to do? Now we're into the fourth Industrial Revolution. We've got a nice panel to talk about it, but nobody talks about the downside of the fourth Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. I don't think we even know what the downside of the Industrial Revolution is all about. So these, these are issues to me, are great challenges because we are going into an unknown. Already now, uh, the three things that I would want to emphasize in this particular context is we are, we are set to be moving into another era of Anthropocene. Mm -hmm. From the Holocene of, of the 12,000 years that we are able to build the civilization that we've got today, now we're moving into another era called the Anthropocene where human beings are beginning to dismantle their own civilization because the, the disconnect that we've got. And the disconnect to me is about leadership, it's about education, it's about awareness. Anthropocene is one. And in, in the last uh, dialogue that I had in 2015, when we talk about intelligence, we already been talking then about transhuman, the transhumanists, yeah, the post-human. And these are the people who will be a hybrid between human and machine. And they are said to be here around, maybe around in the year 2050, maybe 30 years from now. And if this does really happen, now, what happened to us? What happened to our education system? We have not even talked about this. And of course, the very basic about this whole question of colonialization. Could AI be another instrument to colonize other countries that has not got any AI? You don't have to be the person there, only the thoughts, the mind. And through the AI itself, it could be another form of colonialism. And these are, these are the negative parts that to me are grand challenges because once we end up with this, we do not know what the solution would be. And all of us will suffer in, in, this, in this particular context. I would like to look at it in a very cautious state. I'm not saying that technology is not important. It is. But how do you balance this? Mm -hmm. The goods and the bads. All the discussion is all about the good. You know? And the other thing, Kyung, basically, when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, I think it was in the World Economic Forum of 2016, I think. Yeah, that was the first time. And my country hopped into this uh, like something which is, you know, something which is good. Certainly, it is good to a certain extent. But 2015, when the United Nations declares the Sustainable Development Goals, one year before uh, the World uh, Economic Forum declares uh, the fourth industrial revolution, nobody picks it up. Nobody talks about sustainable development the way we talked about on the Industrial Revolution. And I think the sustainable development is a more humanistic goal that balances what the technology is yeah. going to bring about. Yeah. So without these two coming together, I don't know whether, whether we'll be able to handle the so-called right. grand challenges from, from my point of mm. view. So uh, from your top view, the discussion, so we really need to have a kind of balance between you know, kind of opportunities, uh, opportunities from the technological innovation, but also we, we really need to engage with a different type of challenges, yes. such as the challenges and also environmental challenges. So what about um, George? <coughs> so um, do you, would you like to respond to this, this question? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I've, I've had a shock in the last week mm. because I went to a meeting, a forum on how are we going to convert to green or sustainable energy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I thought, good, I can do my part in helping save the world. At the end of that part, when I got through this, I, know, I was saying, I hope I help make the disasters that are coming not as bad. Okay. So it's a, a different. So if you look at what's going on, we find there's both tremendous demand for energy and tremendous shock to the climate as a result of that, um, and great instability in the world. The most of the burning of CO2 you know, fuels that produce CO2. Happened started about 70 years ago, but starting 50 years ago, we had a shock that took us from 2% of the GDP of the world up to 10 or 12%, and then it came back down, and there was another shock. And then when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was another shock. It got up to 13% of the world's GDP. Mm -hmm. That is really 
big perturbations on the system. So it's a situation where I look at what's going on, and I'll talk about two other things. There will always be at least two crises going on in the world from now, from now for the next 20 years. It's just, you, you got to be able to adapt to that kind of stuff. To do what's necessary, we're going to have to spend $1.3 trillion this year, this coming year, on conversion to sustainable energy. And part of that's for clean energy, part of that's for electric transport. I mean, those are big amounts of money. Part of that's for some of the other technologies and so forth. It is really serious money, and it's very hard for the third world countries to get a, their piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. It also means, in order to do this conversion to clean energy, we need three billion tons of various metals. Do you know how much three billion tons is? <laughs> you could cover, you know, all of Korea with that. We're going to have to either tear up the earth or we're going to have to go out and get near earth or asteroids and, and mine them. There, when you actually start saying we're going to truly address the problems, you find that it's just a massive situation and you have a big built-in infrastructure. You've got to work hard and you've got to work cooperatively to make this kind of thing. And most people can't adjust to that. They're going to keep doing what they're... I mean, there are people trained to build one coal-fired plant in China every week. They have enough people to do that. So they can keep doing that, but they only have enough people to make one nuclear power plant mm -hmm. a month. Okay. Now, Korea should have a bunch of nuclear, more nuclear power plants because China was shocked this year. They found they needed much more energy than they thought they needed. Well, why? Well, climate change all the top 10 or 20 cities had floods, mm. every single one of them last year, and they all used more energy than you would expect because they had huge heat waves, and guess what? They ran electricity, but they were running their factories more, and so that's, a, that's the kind of a, a thing. When you start being concrete, then you can start thinking about what you're going to need to deal with it because making that conversion, we're making a 5% or so change per year, if we're going to make the conversion at a reasonable time, it's going to stretch out over 20 years. Right? So it's, sure. it's a lot of what's going to happen in the future. And that's not the only thing that's going on. At the same time, there are good things that are going to have secondary effects. So there's a big effort in basically making intelligent factories, factories that can make them. And we're going to need them because we need to make windmills. We need to make more solar panels. We need to make electric cars. We need to make a bunch of this other stuff. Y you, you're going to have mm. you're going to have these plants, which are going to be supervised by AI and humans, mm -hmm. and they're going to be automated, right? And they're doing that. So Volkswagen is, you know, doing stuff in middle middle China to build a bunch of electric Volkswagens to sell to the to the Chinese. Sure. The mm. you just keep going on. So uh, Michael and I were just at a meeting just before this, at which I gave a talk about the rapid advances in AI and how they're finally beginning to discover drugs, right? Right now, you have a 10 to 15 year plan and you have a fair number of people employed trying to, trying to discover drugs, trying to do clinical trials and so forth. Many of those are gonna be replaced by AI systems. So how do I think about what the future is gonna be? We're gonna to have to teach people to be flexible. We're gonna to have to do, tell, teach people that things are going to change and that they're going to have to uh, be able to adapt with it because the jobs in factories, the jobs in drug testing, those kind of things are going to be shifted. Sure, absolutely. Connecting to this, um, you know, uh, trans uh, different type of transformation, including energy transformation, digital transformation is another uh, very important part. So in your very interesting pr presentation in the previous session, so you talked about kind of socioeconomic disparity in, in education. Like digital divide, how would you uh, write to address uh, these issues in the kind of broad understanding of a digital transformation? Uh, you mean the, this uh, inequity, inequity? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a great question, and it uh, it is actually part of these grand challenges that we are talking about the overall inequality. I think one one thing that we need to do at the government levels around the world is to to be sure and clear that what we are talking about. Uh, here we have been talking about inequality. Inequality is a different, or equality is a different thing than equity of education outcomes that I was showing earlier. 
Um, you know, as long as we don't have a clear common idea what we are talking about, it's very difficult to get any solutions. And this applies also in the government levels. There are a number of governments that are not, not able to address this issue because people have different views of what we are talking about. For example, some people may think that this equity or equality conversation is about access, equal access to good education or curriculum, whereas the others are looking at the, out, at the equity of outcomes, the fairness of uh, education outcomes. So I, I, I think that that's one thing that we really need to um, uh, really need to do. Then the other one, of course, is the, the political will, whether we want to do that. Still, uh, again, at the government levels, often it's much more favorable to have a narrative about excellence in education, mm -hmm. uh, meaning, uh, you know, educating and raising the, the, the academic or, or knowledge talent in the countries, and then do what is left to, to educate the rest. And I think now we do know, and this is based on the fairly recent research and analysis, mostly uh, coming from the OECD's data, that the education systems can be redesigned in a way that we don't need to anymore debate whether excellence is more important for the economy of the state or the social cohesion of the countries than equity. That the smart policies can be designed in a way that both equity of education outcomes and excellence of education outcomes as well can coexist simultaneously. And, and this is the big call, and, and the, as I said, the OECD has done uh, a remarkable job in bringing this conversation to the, the government uh, level uh, narratives, sure. trying to avoid this uh, confrontation of often political uh, debates about equity and excellence. But it's, it's very important that in a forums like this and uh, in, in a government level, policy considerations that we have a good understanding what equity in education means. As long as we don't have a definition for that or agreement, it's going to be very difficult to monitor you know, th this type of progress or lack of progress. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, there will be no accountability mechanisms of holding anybody accountable for this. Like in Australia, what you saw there, nobody is accountable for this because we don't have, we don't still don't have a government level uh, agreement and understanding what we are talking about. So that's, that's what is at stake. Very interesting. So um, I also think that technology itself doesn't necessarily lead to the accountability in governments. So you also mentioned about leadership and then you also mentioned about collaboration. So we are actually coming from the scientific community, but how, we can, uh, how can we collaborate with uh, different type of stakeholders? Because we have a uh, local actors and you know, civil society and business sector, private sector and government. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? How we can actually collaborate? Um, sure. So Let me try. I mean, after, after telling you what the issue is from our point of view, what we have done is basically trying to redefine again what university is and what, the, what type of education should we give working with the government and the industry and even the community. First thing, for example, all my students in my university will have to understand sustainable development. Everybody must go through this compulsory course, understanding what sustainable development is about. That would be the kind of benchmark that we want them to think about. Whatever else that comes in, fourth industrial revolution, where does it fit in the context of sustainable development? That's one. Secondly, all of them will have to work with the community. Everybody must have got a project with the community. We have been so much uh, into, uh, in the industry, which is nothing wrong, but we also learned when the pandemic comes, the first one to close down was the industry. And they say, we don't need your student anymore, we don't have, you know, we don't have jobs for you and stuff like that. And who bails us out is the community. So now we go back to the community and tell them how to work with the community, how to profile the community, how to find what problems do they face and how to actually solve this problem as part of their commitment to giving back knowledge that they've got from the university. And the third one is what we call irresponsible research. In other words, all research that's done in a university must concern the people who are involved. Mm. If it's a community, the community must be involved. It's not a way that we just do the research in the lab and then plong it onto them and say, this is a solution. No. And, and the community will be part of the evaluator. They will say that your, your research is successful because it solves my problem. They benefit from our research. It doesn't matter whether we are a tier one, tier two, tier three, when they've got an impact factor of 10. My question to them is, what is the impact on the ground? You've got an impact factor of 10 and you don't have impact on the ground, then your research is still not complete. So we're beginning to redefine this so that people know exactly what you should be doing and how do we actually work. I don't know whether it will, uh, you know, 
lay away the, the grand challenges. But at least the mindset has changed. Sure. The mindset is not a pre-COVID mindset. <laughs> hoping it is a post-COVID mindset that talks about humanity in the real terms rather than just on a piece of paper. Sure. Hermit or... I think one of the things that we have to teach people mm. is that we're actually in a, re a time period when things are urgent because mm. there are crises and real problems facing it and that they have to be kind of realistic. They can't say, this is how it should be. They say, what can we do working with government, working with industry, working with the general population to come up with a solution that's going to get us through this bad spot. Everybody has a stake in what's going on. Sure. Thank you. Of course, uh, we have to uh, still to consider the scientists, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the overarching scientists, uh, like the one who started the climate changes in, 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 in footstumps and to, and, and to, and to listen to what, what they tell us and uh, they analyze the reasons for the global warming and also find out what is the most important measures to, to fight global warming. In my opinion, what we have, of course, we, we, have, we all have uh, the technology around to fight global warming. We have to use photovoltaic cells and windmills, and we have to develop energy storage. You know? I'm not a fan of the hydrogen business, because we, when you produce hydrogen, you lose, you lose too much energy. I am thinking that uh, uh, transferring energy via the direct ele electric high voltage current is a much better method. And for instance, I'm very pleased to see that uh, they plan to transfer energy, solar energy from Australia to Singapore has been resumed. And uh, I think that also might be sooner or later uh, that you could become connected to that. Australia is, of course, very important because when, when it's summer in Australia, it's winter here. So uh, it just, just compensates each other and uh, the losses in, uh, in, in elect electricity uh, uh, trans transport is, is about 3% for 1,000 kilometers. Sure. So it's doable. So we, in Europe, we should actually revive the plans to uh, the Dissertec mm -hmm. plans to generate electri electricity in North Africa, maybe in Saudi Arabia, and transfer the energy mm -hmm. to Europe, but not to, in my opinion, not to hydrolyze, to, el to electrolyze uh, water in, in Africa, but uh, and, and transferred by, via ships or pipelines to Europe, but transferred by, hyd by uh, electricity, and then, to, and then to electrolyze water to produce hydrogen where it needed in steel production places and cement production places. Sure, yeah. So before we close here, I'd like to just give you a 30 seconds for <laughs> kind of finalizing <laughs> your plus comments. 30. Right. You give me sure. plus a minute. <laughs> Any comments on this? No. Or you can just wrap up. <laughs> or? I'll tell them it's going to be an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be very interesting. We're going to be living yeah, in interesting sure. times. But, but let, let, let me leave you a 30 sure. second thing because, you know, a part of this conversation, of course, is how do we fix some of these uh, broken or dysfunctional systems like education in, in, in many ways. I think, you know, too often we think about what should we do next? Like, what, what is the next reform or next thing to do? Uh, and you know, the alternative way to think, of, and I know the colleagues know this better than I do, is to think about what should we stop doing. And there's so much happening in, in especially school education systems around the world that has nothing to do with the children or teaching or learning or education at all. So education systems around the world have really become like a Christmas trees, and there's so much decorations around that you cannot see the function and form anymore inside there. So, you, you know, if you lose your hope and, and become frustrated about what to do next, Try this one. Like, like, what would be those things in your own education system or own school that could be removed without doing any harm for anyone? Actually, that would I improve the, the the work of the people there, so that they can really focus on all these beautiful things that we have heard today. So that would be alternative way to think about you know solving this problem rather than try to invent yet another reform that has been pretty much the problem in education systems around the world during the last 50 years. Sure, with that, you know, it's been an excellent discussion today. So with that, you know, we're gonna close the, uh, the, our panel. Thank you so much, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Pasi. Well, my congratulations to those of you who are still here. <laughs> um, I think that um, having lasted through a very long day of discussions, you all deserve a round of applause. So I think we should applaud you. Our last panel uh, 
should, I think, be quite relaxed and light-hearted. It's entitled My Best Teacher, and for it, I'm happy to bring together our five visiting Nobel laureates, and Lynn and Liz, who are both teachers, or were both teachers themselves. And so, who better to talk about stories of my best teacher? So if I can invite all panelists to join me on stage. Go out. <laughs> Oh, but why don't you sit there? Yeah. Liz, do you want to come here? Sure. Yeah. Lynn, do you want to be there? And then, yes, if the three of you, if you just, oh, four of you, if you just take your seats in a row. <laughs> I don't know. It's as, it's as good arrangement as any. It's, thank you so much. Um, okay. So this is just a chance to tell some stories about best teacher. You can tell about your worst teacher if you like. I have to say, Liz, that if I was to start off, I think my best teacher is somebody I missed. I, it would have been you had I had, a te had, I had you as a teacher. You, that, that lecture was just thank so you. beautiful. So thank you very much thank indeed. You. Where should we begin? Why do we begin with you? Do you want to start with your best teacher? Uh, sure. Um, my best teacher, um, I'm going to name her because I think it's really important and if she's watching somewhere, I would like her to know. Her name is Judith Arkbauer and when I was nine years old, I had immigrated to the States for the first time speaking not a single word of English and this is 80s, small town Ohio and I didn't belong there. Um, I didn't know how to belong there and I remember... Um, one very significant moment was I was at recess, sitting by myself, watching kids play jump rope, and I wanted to jump in, and I didn't know how. Um, and she came outside and sat next to me on the bleachers, and she said, hi. And she started talking to me about every kid who was on the playground, and said, oh, look at so-and-so, look at so-and-so. And she sat with me um, to make sure that I didn't feel alone. Uh, she knew that I didn't understand any of the language, but she allowed me to have company in a place that was foreign. Um, and of course, she taught me all the way through. I, I was there for not a long time, but um, she saw me for who I was and what I needed. She could call me by name and cared for me. And so Mrs. Judith Arkbauer is one of my best teachers in memory. Beautiful. Thank you very much indeed. I, there's no order for this. We can go along the line, but feel free to interrupt each other as, as you go along. So, Hartmut, do you want to go? Okay, Chile. I went to school, to high school, after World War II. And I have to say that uh, many of the teachers were still mentally influenced by their experience as soldiers in World, in World War II. So uh, that was, was one issue which was popular, which of course happily changed now. Uh, the other issue was that uh, teachers were dressed at high school very formally. So each teacher had a jacket and a tie. And the only teacher who didn't wear a tie was our last teacher in arts. So the arts teachers was, was there the most progressive teacher at the school. So in general, our teachers in science and mathematics were excellent, were outstanding, and the best teacher which I ever experienced was our physics teacher. And it was primarily because he conducted experiments and explained the experiments, so, and, uh, so he also let us do experiments. And at the end of this, actually, not only myself, but most of, my, of the other students also believed that based on physics, you can understand everything. And nowadays, I don't believe that we can understand everything, particularly in particular what happens in your brain. Well, the, the physicists, especially the phys physics laureates, the phys often the tell physics. us that, th that physics is the key to everything. Well, it's the key to everything. Lynn. So, um, yeah, this is a very hard question to answer uh, because I think that I had a very pleasant experience um, in school and so um, had lots of teachers whom I remember fondly. but. Actually, I think that uh, an, uh, an important teacher who helped me to become um, a different person was someone actually in graduate school. Um, so, and like Liz, I'm going to name her. This was my professor, Karen Zumwalt, who is now retired from Teachers College, Columbia University. Uh, but I was a master's student, and I took her class um, in curriculum design. And it, at midterm, she would have conferences with her students to tell them how they were doing. 
And so she told me that um, if she were to give me a grade that day, it would be a B plus. Now, a B plus is not a bad grade, but all my papers had been A papers. I had not missed a class. I participated in everything, and I told her this. And she said, well, you need to talk more in class. And I said, I talk in the groups all the time, because she would break us up into small groups and have discussions. Um, and she said, but you never say anything in, in the whole class. And, and so I murmured something about, you know, being shy or that's not my way. Because I did go to school in Singapore where students were silent and we received, we did not speak. Um, I didn't speak in, 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 in university either. It was only in graduate school that I found my voice. Um, so she said something really important. She said, you have important things to say that other people need to hear. So from that day forward, I set myself a goal that I would say something in class each time. And sometimes it was something stupid. What, what time is break? <laughs> uh, it, how, how many pages do we have to read? <laughs> Just to hear myself speak mm. in the space. From that time, you know, it's, you know, the first time it's hard, and the tenth time it's, it's a little hard, and the hundredth time, it feels just right. Um, mm. So, Karen Zumwalt helped me find my voice um, as a teacher, and um, many people wish that she hadn't done that because now they wish that I would shut up. <laughs> but um, I remember her always, and I've told her this too. Well, mm -hmm. here's one moderator who's grateful to Karen Zumwalt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the story. Yeah, I can. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I always had a knack for for physics, um, even before I knew uh, what physics was. And uh, so um, for me, uh, the physics teacher uh, was uh, very important and uh, was of crucial importance. Uh, and he was a fantastic teacher. I, I was very lucky. He was educated in Göttingen. Uh, and uh, and he, I think James Frank was, was one of his teachers uh, at the time. Uh, another Nobel laureate uh, with a CK. Um, and uh, he, so his name was, uh, <coughs> was Willy Schröder, and we called him Schöner Willi, Schöne Willi or, or Beautiful Willy, because he always kept his, um, his hair in, in waves. And then, <coughs> so later, later I got really confused because of the Schrodinger's uh, wave, <laughs> wave function. <laughs> I confused the two people. Um, but but he, was an, uh, he was an absolute uh, inspiration. And uh, I, uh, <coughs> I did uh, some kind of advanced courses with him, uh, just uh, with, with three other people. And so we had, we had very uh, uh, intimate uh, contact with him in, 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 in all these uh, experiments. Mm. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. And for those of us who ha find it hard to handle Schrodinger's equation, yes, the image of wavy hair <laughs> will get us through. Exactly, yeah. It was <laughs> it's the right picture. It was prefigured. <laughs> okay, thank you. When I first saw this question, I go, oh, no, no. Right? And then I realize it's because I've had a series of good teachers with some bad teachers in between, and I, I didn't know how to pick it out and stuff. And then it just came to me. It was my mother. So I have two little vignettes. My mother is the first one that sort of explained to me there's an external world and it's rational. You can understand stuff. I, re I have recounted the fact that we were coming back from our cousins and I saw the moon following us in the car when we were driving home. I said, how can the moon follow me like the dog? She said, everyone sees the moon. Just wait till the fall festival next week. Well, actually, I saw the moon here yesterday. The, and she explained to me, it's big and there's parallax and everyone sees the moon following them. And I thought, oh, this is really cool because roadside signs moved by us, but the moon doesn't. And, all this, and I started understanding that you could understand the world. Then I had a series of good and bad teachers through school. And then I had a good teachers at MIT and a good thesis advisor. And then I got a job at Berkeley, and Louis Alvarez, a Nobel laureate, hired me there. And he pretty much gave me free reign, but he had this habit, he would like us to try and eat lunch with him sometimes. And he would ask us questions about what we're doing or tell us stories. And at the time, there were seven Nobel laureates in Berkeley, 
And sometimes we'd eat lunch together, and they would tell stories about Los Alamos, and they would ask, they'd give examples and ask the, the non Nobel laureates questions, right? Sort of, a, sort of a grilling. And one day I'm sitting at the table, and I'm the only not Nobel laureate. Everyone else has a Nobel laureate, right? And it's not me thinking, well, I'll get one someday. It's me thinking, oh, God, I hope they don't ask me really hard questions. <laughs> I'm sitting there so that I can learn and do this kind of stuff, but they're going to ask me hard questions. And they did. They, they, you know, you learned that they were people, and you learned they worked hard, and they were smart, and they had skills, and they did this stuff. And, but they asked you questions, and they made you think. And so I started doing that when I was here at Iwa. I used to take the grad students postdocs at least four days a week to lunch, and I'd ask them questions like, what's the best material to make a hot pot out of? And they had to figure out, could you make a better design for a hot pot? Or, this is just a solar flare in the sun, when's it going to make it dangerous for you to fly over to Japan? Right? This kind of, I ask them these questions, and they had to figure this stuff out. So I've tried to carry on the tradition of the previous generation of Nobel laureates and so forth, including, I just, just before this last week, I had lunch with graduate students and postdocs, and I asked them, what did they learn from the Oppenheimer movie? What was the big thing that they learned? Because that was a big thing in my day, because I heard, kept hearing about, mm. you know, Los Alamos. But. Mm. So, um, they I made it live for me. They made me pay attention. Because I suppose everybody, when they're little, asks questions. Um, that moon question seems to be pretty pretty special, but... They no, my but mother was a teacher, then she became a science teacher, and then a principal. But it, and they, my parents valued education, and my mother went, even more so, went back to graduate school and got her degree, you know, while I was a young student, right? While I was, right? But, so it's an example, and I, I would say it's genetically built into all mammal parents, maybe all animal parents, to take, make sure their kids get the best education and to survive the best. That's evolution. So when we talk about education, people want the best education for their kids. The better parents they are, the better they're going to do that. Thank you. Lynn, I noticed you, you're surrounded on all sides by Nobel laureates. You're repeating yeah, it's just normal. the experience if they start <laughs> asking you questions. Lucky you have your voice. <laughs> Michael. So uh, hearing these stories about school teachers, um, I actually was schooled in South Africa, and uh, as a teenager, I was much more interested in parties, girls, and snooker. And in fact, it was snooker that kind of gave me my big break, because once I came back extremely late at night from snooker, and my mother grounded me, which ended up me working harder and so on. Um, but thinking about my uh, best teacher, and I, like uh, George, met many, many Nobel laureates in Cambridge, where I was studying. And, uh, but one really stands out. So I knew Francis Crick quite well, uh, John Kendrew, Aaron Klug, and Max Perutz. And Max Perutz, for me, was the true genius, not because he invented protein crystallography, which he did, but because he had a touch, a social touch, a human touch, that was quite amazing. And uh, one example of this, and there's probably two I can give, is that uh, Prutz ran the MRC lab, he founded it, a lab that ended up getting 28 Nobel Prizes for a lab of 300 people and maybe a alumni staff of 3,000. Um, Prutz invented protein crystallography. Uh, John Kendrew worked as, as Prutz's assistant. But what isn't known is that when Crick and Watson were writing the famous DNA paper, Crick was actually Max Perutz's PhD student. Not only that, Max Perutz is said to have shown Perutz and Watson the critical photograph from Rosalind Franklin. But it's not Watson, Crick, Perutz. Perutz isn't even thanked on that paper. So Perutz realized that giving young people independence and responsibility was the essential thing needed in science then. Uh, another experience, I was doing a PhD in Cambridge, and third year PhD, I got a phone call from Max Brutz to our house, not his secretary, saying he just won the Royal Society Copley Medal. Would I come to his office for wine and cheese or wine and cake th that Friday? Now, he didn't ask his secretary to call me, and I thought when I went there, I would suddenly be meeting all the hotshots. But as a PhD student, I was one of the most senior people there because he'd invited 
the bottle washers and the lab technicians and the photographic people into the room. And I remember one of the technicians in the mechanical room holding up the metal and saying, mm, this is you know, 15 mil, it's probably worth this. <laughs> Uh, so this is this human touch that is absolutely amazing. He had an incredible influence. Uh, often, I must remember another memory. My first year there, they would have lectures, and a student was speaking about a model for the cerebellum. And Francis Quick said to the student, please explain your work simply so Max Proust can understand it. And Max was not in any way bothered by this. <laughs> he thought this was totally appropriate. So I think we realized that Science is a mixture of great people doing great discoveries, but also of humanity, of empathy, of not elevating yourself. So he was definitely my greatest teacher. Thank you very much. And just bringing many of the themes together, Francis Crick, I believe, was also a great advocate of asking what he would have termed a stupid question. He just asked any question that came to him, did he not? Crick was amazing, but in some ways, the most amazing of the Cambridge scientists was Sidney Brenner. Sidney Brenner is the only laureate who had five laureates working with him. Many laureates have two laureates working with them because the prize is three people, but he has five. And I don't know if you've ever met Sidney Brenner, but he was always telling jokes and just sprouting out ideas like a, like a, a lawn sprinkler. And, you know, it had an effect. <coughs> Thank you. All right, so I, um, I, I was also quite, quite blessed with the good good teachers, but what is important is, is not only uh, that he or her appears in your life, but also it appears in the right time, because I had uh, the right teacher at the, at the right moment of, of my life. Like, uh, when, I, when I was in school, I was reasonably good in, in, in physics and math, and it was, uh, it was so easy to, to, to relax. So I didn't need to apply any, any efforts to, to be the best in the class. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I, I started in a tiny school in, in a tiny, tiny city in the middle of, of nowhere. So it wasn't that difficult. And then your, uh, my teacher and, and my parents as well, they were just pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. So if you are blessed with some uh, good abilities. It's not. It's not. Yeah, it's. It's not your achievement. It's the. It's the blessing. You. You really need to push harder and harder and harder. And then you, I basically, almost by myself, just found uh, an extra, uh, extra problems to uh, to solve and uh, and so on. And then it, so this this pushing. Not not even talking about physics or math, but but really encouraging. Uh, and, and showing the, the space that knowledge is really infinite, you can always get, you can always get better. So th that was really important at the, at the time. And then I, I, um, I managed to, to get into um, a, a very good university. It's, it's a tiny physics school in, uh, in, in Moscow, really, really small one. And, uh, but the, the uh, Again, the blessing is that uh, our teachers were active scientists from the uh, from the Academy of Science, and so you study there for six years. It's very very intense. So you 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 basically just uh, so exams are, are very tough. And and I remember the typical story from the exam that, that you study all the night long for several nights in the in the row just and. At the end of the day, so you, you, you wake up in the morning of, of the exam and you think, okay, now you are actually understand what is going on. You go to, to, to this exam and this, and this teacher, this, this examiner, his first task or her first task is really to smash you and show that you don't understand anything at all. And really, and, and then, so that's basically takes it doesn't take long for, a, for any, any professor to, uh, to smash a student, maybe like 20 minutes. And then for another 40 minutes, he or she would educate you, and, then, and basically you just, you just come at a, at a very high, high peak, and then you, you, you're really down in the middle of the exam, and then you, 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 you get out again with the feeling that, okay, now I actually do know what, 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 what this, this subject is. And then for my, uh, for my PhD years, I was again blessed to, to work with my um, supervisor at the time, colleague and friend, so with, uh, with, uh, with whom we got the, uh, the prize, with Andre Geim. 
And it's really, uh, it was really helpful because he, not probably deliberately, but at least I could see how you can learn how to make, uh, how to do science. Because, so they teach us physics, math, biology, but that's subjects, though that's not science. Science is a very strange object which is probably very difficult to define positively because science is everything which is outside of the known mass of, of knowledge. So something, so something new, something which doesn't exist yet. So how do you search for something which doesn't, which, which, which doesn't exist? And then, and, and it's really tricky to, to, uh, to uh, create your own methodology for science and, and that's what I was, uh, I was, uh, I was blessed to, to learn from my, from my colleague and then uh, so I, I'm still keep, keep learning up to now. Thank you very much indeed, Kostya. So Liz, you had almost the first word in the conference. I'm going to give you the last word as well. Uh, um, I'm going to make you jealous because I have the best teacher right now and this teacher that I have teaches me endless patience challenges me with the most difficult questions on a daily basis and forces me to be creative almost on a minute by minute basis and it's my three-year-old son <laughs> and every day we're supposed to be learning and i hope you know we have many generations up here and we're talking about you know the professors and the teachers but please understand that I have the best teacher right now because I'm living it with a child. And so as you think about your best teachers, I hope you don't think only outside, inside the box of who has a label of a teacher, but recognize that there are young people around you that'll teach you and challenge you all the time. And I am so grateful that I have one that I can call my own that is the best teacher for me in this very moment as I learn on a daily basis. Beautifully said, Liz. Yes, as the possess possessor of a 17-year-old <laughs> child, I would say, yes, they do certainly challenge you all the time, and I'm not sure everything they teach you is... Well, anyway, that's another story, another, another story for another day. They teach you patience. It's patience. a good skill in life, yes, very important. <laughs> uh, that's been a beautiful discussion. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, a lovely way to finish this conference. Um, that's it for today. Uh, we have closing comments from two people. First will be Lara Spreckman, CEO of Nobel Prize Outreach. Um, so if we leave the stage, they will clear it. And Thank that's you. the end. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Nobel laureates, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. How to summarize what we have heard here today? Well, rather than summarizing, the task for us is to get emboldened, to be inspired to make a difference. That is what learning and education enable us to do. To quote Nobel Peace Laureate Malala Yousafzai, she said, let us pick up our books and our pens. They are the most powerful weapons. One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. As we learned today, there are many ways of learning. We find our own paths and motivations. The key is to find those motivations and to have someone inspire us. Often, it's a special teacher that gives us that necessary spark, as we just heard a few minutes ago. In Malala's case, the Taliban banned her and many other girls from attending school. Just think about that for a minute. Think about lives not lived, the potential not fulfilled. The doors to economic opportunity, to ideas and to freedom closed shut. It seems incredible that in this day and age, 
we still have to fight for putting girls to school. But fight we will until every single child is given that gift. It's also worth reflecting for a moment on the incredible progress we have achieved. Progress in education the last 125 years is one of humanity's greatest achievements. In the year 1900, just one year before the first Nobel Prize was awarded, only 20% of the global population were literate. Only one in five people. Today, 86% of people are literate, nearly nine out of 10 people. How will education and science evolve in the next century? Well, obviously, we need to encourage more women into STEM, for sure. It's now clear that in the coming decades, artificial intelligence we have, will have an enormously disruptive impact on education and science. We discussed that just a while ago. There are many unknowns, but there are also many risks. It's important now that we build the institutions to allow us to navigate this transformation in ways that benefit society. This is why events like this today are so important. This is a moment to explore ideas and have space to discuss the challenges very openly. So thank you all for contributing to such a lovely and lively debate. This is the sign of a healthy intellectual society. Finally, when speaking about learning, I would like to remind you that it's just a bit more than a week until we announce this year's Nobel Prizes. And tied to that, we publish teacher material for all teachers around the world to quickly explain this year's Nobel Prizes to their students. So if you're a teacher, please go on our website, nobelprize.org, to find those every day, well, after 24 hours, and recommend it to your peers. And there you will also find information about our teacher global network. So with this, I would like to thank you all, distinguished Nobel laureates and speakers, for all we have heard and learned together, to Professor Uk Jon Ju and Professor Ari Moon at CAST for this great collaboration, and not least to Ye Hong Li and the entire team for your fantastic work. Our Nobel International Partners, 3M, ABB, Capgemini, EQT, H2 Green Steel, and Scania for your support to the Embassy of Sweden and the Ambassador, Daniel Volven, and not least to my dear and wonderful colleagues to pulling this off. You are fantastic. Finally, thank you all for attending Kam Samida. So, uh, before our very last closing speech, uh, it just remains for me to once again thank you all for being here. It's been an enormous pleasure working with you all, working with CAST, and being here in Seoul. When this ends, I'd like to ask special guests to follow the signs to the reception. But for now, that's it from me, and I would, it's just my pleasure to introduce Eri Moon, who is Vice President for External Affairs at CAST and Chair of the Local Organizing Committee. Please join me in welcoming Eri Moon. Distinguished laureates, panelists, and our respectable colleagues and students. Uh, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure and honor to deliver clo closing remarks. Uh, thanks to your active participation, I am happy to say that the Nobel Prize dialogue 
Seoul 2023 was successful and fruitful. Uh, we have a total of 1,150 attendees today. And most of the attendees are still here. Uh, like Adam uh, suggested before, why don't we give a big applause to ourselves? <laughs> we deserve it. The CAST is uh, one of the most prestigious organizations comprised of uh, Korean leading scholars in science and technology. We are very pleased to have hosted this event in cooperation with uh, Nobel Prize Outreach. Hosting this event was a special, precious, and grateful experience to us. On behalf of the local organizing committee, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Nobel Prize laureates and the panelists who shared their precious experiences and valuable insights on today's theme of future learning. I would also like to thank Mr. Vidar Helgeson, uh, the executive director of the Nobel Foundation for his great support. My sincere appreciation goes to the CEO of uh, the Nobel Prize Outreach, Ms. Laura Sprechman, and the CSO, Dr. Adam Smith, for their numerous efforts over the past three years, from planning to conducting this event. I also appreciate the partners for their generous support. My special thanks goes to the members of the organizing committee and the staffs, especially Mr. Jaehyung Lee, who made this event a reality. Without their enthusiasm and devotion, this event would not have been possible. Since the essence of this event was a dialogue, I would like to express my gratitude to all of you who actively participated and contributed to enriching the conversations. This event gave us a venue to explore a variety of aspects on the current situations and future prospects of learning and educating. Furthermore, I believe that the insights and expertise of the Nobel Prize laureates as well as the panelists will be profitable to us, enriching our knowledge and thoughts on the purpose of education, digital transformation, scientific creativity, and diversity in STEM, or STEAM. Hopefully, the Nobel Prize Dialogue Seoul 2023 provided a wonderful platform to share and exchange ideas, which would greatly contribute to the promotion of science and technology through educating future generations with wisdom and balance. September is a good time to visit Korea. I hope you have a beautiful memory during your stay and have a safe trip back to your country. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all of you. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. <laughs>